this what you want? The Hobbit, Part 1, by J.R.R. Tolkien. In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door like a porthole, painted green, with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. The door opened onto a tube-shaped hall like a tunnel, a very comfortable tunnel without smoke, with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. The Hobbit was fond of visitors. He was a very well-to-do Hobbit, and his name was... Baggins, Bilbo Baggins. He was about fifty years old or so, and had lived in the beautiful hobbit hole in what was called Bag End for many years, and had, in fact, apparently settled down immovably. By some curious chance, one morning long ago in the quiet of the world, when there was less noise and more green, and the hobbits were still numerous and prosperous, Bilbo Baggins was standing at his door after breakfast, smoking an enormous long wooden pipe that reached nearly down to his woolly toes, when an old man with a staff came by. He had a tall, pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, a silver scarf over which a white beard hung down below his waist, and immense black boots. Good morning. What do you mean? Do you wish me a good morning, or that it is a good morning whether I want it or not, or that you feel good this morning, or that it is a morning to be good on? All of them at once, and a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors into the bargain. If you have a pipe about you, sit down and have a fill of my pipe weed. Bah. There's no hurry. We have all day before us to blow grey rings of smoke. Very pretty. But I've no time to blow smoke rings this morning. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure that I'm arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. I should think so in these parts. We're plain, quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things no. make you late for dinner. I can't think what anybody sees in them. We don't want any adventures here, thank you. Good morning. What a lot of things you use good morning for. Now you mean that you want to get rid of me, and that it won't be a good morning till I move off. Not at all, not at all, my dear sir. Let me see. I, I, I don't think I know your name. I know your name, Mr. Bilbo Baggins, and you know my name, though you don't remember that I belong to it. I am Gandalf. <sighs> to think that I should have lived to be good morning by Belladonna Took's son, as if I was selling buttons at the door. Gandalf! Gandalf! Good gracious me, not the wandering wizard that used to make such particularly excellent fireworks. I remember those. Not the Gandalf who was responsible for so many quiet lads and lasses going off on mad adventures, anything from climbing trees to visiting elves or sailing ships to other shores. Bless me, I beg your pardon, but I had no idea you were still in business. Now, where else should I be? Well, I'm pleased to find you remembering something about me. Indeed, for your old grandfather took sake and for the sake of poor Belladonna, your mother, I'll give you what you asked for. I beg your pardon. I haven't asked for anything. Yes, you have. Twice now. My pardon. I give it to you. In fact, I'll go so far as to send you on this adventure. Very amusing for me, very good for you, and profitable too, very likely, if you ever get over it. Sorry, I, I don't want any adventures, huh? thank you. Uh, not today. Uh, good morning. Uh, but please come to tea uh, any time you like. Uh, why not tomorrow? Uh, come tomorrow. Goodbye. 
Oh, what on earth did I ask him to tea for? I think I'd better have a cake or two and something to drink. Oh, what a fright! Gandalf, in the meantime, was still standing outside the door and laughing long but quietly. After a while, he stepped up and with the spike of his staff scratched a queer sign on the hobbit's beautiful green front door. Then he strode away. The next day, Bilbo had almost forgotten about Gandalf. He didn't remember things very well unless he put them down on his engagement tablet like this, Gandalf T. Wednesday. He had been too flustered yesterday to do anything of the kind. Just before tea time, there came a tremendous ring on the front doorbell. And then he remembered. He rushed to put on the kettle and put out another cup and saucer and an extra cake or two and ran to the door. Oh, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Dwalin, at your service. Oh, uh, Bilbo Baggins at yours. I, uh... I'm just about to take tea. Uh, pray come and have some with me. Thank you. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, so you have got here at last. Uh, I see. They have begun to arrive already. That's Dwalin's green hood hanging up. Balin at your service. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, mm. Come along in and, uh, and have some tea. A little beer would suit me better if it's all the same to you, my good sir. Uh, but I don't mind some cake. Seed cake, if you have any. Uh, lots. Oh, my. Uh, what did he mean they have begun to arrive? Oh, uh, oh, that's Gandalf for certain this time. Here's the beer and cake. Excuse me while I answer the door. What can I do for you, my dwarves? Keely, at your service. And Keely. At yours and your family's. Wallen and Ballin here already, I see. Let's join the throng. Throng? I don't like the sound of that. I really must sit down for a minute and collect my wits and have a drink. Uh, somebody at the door. Some four, I should say, by the sound. Besides, we saw them coming along behind us in the distance, didn't we? Oh, gracious, gracious me. Oh, what's happening here? Uh, well, it's not four dwarves after all. It's five. At, at your, your service. Sorry. Nori. Nori. Owen. And Glorm. This is the most awkward Wednesday I can remember. Now what? Somebody's banging with a stick. Carefully, carefully. It's not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the mat and then open the door like a pop gun. Let me introduce Biffa, Bofa, Bomba, and especially Thorin. And your first. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. I, I didn't mean to open so abruptly. Now, don't mention Now, I see 13 hoods hanging in your hallway, Bilbo. <coughs> oh, we're all here, quite a merry gathering. I hope there's something left for the latecomers to eat and drink. There's some tea. What's that, tea? Oh, no, thank you. A little red wine, I think, for me. And for me. And raspberry jam and apple tart. And mince pies and cheese. And pork pie and salad. And more cake. <laughs> and ale. And coffee, if you don't mind. Put on a few eggs, there's a good fellow. And just bring out the cold chicken and pickle. <laughs> mm, seems to know as much about the inside of my larder as I do myself. And fusticate and bother those dwarves. Why don't they come and lend a hand? Gandalf sat at the head of the party with the thirteen dwarves all round. And Bilbo sat on a stool at the fireside, nibbling at a biscuit. His appetite was quite taken away, trying to look as if this was all perfectly ordinary and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate and ate and talked and talked, and time got on. I suppose you'll all stay to supper? Of course. Sure. And sure. after. We shan't get through the business till later, and we must have some music first. Bring out the instruments. Excuse me, I left mine on the porch. Well, just bring mine in with you. <clears throat> That's it. All right, are you ready? Good job. I'll listen for the time.
As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands and by cunning and by magic moving through him, a fierce and jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Then something Tookish woke up inside him, and he wished to go and see the great mountains and explore the caves and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He looked out of the window. The stars were out in a dark sky above the trees. He thought of the jewels of the dwarves shining in dark caverns. Suddenly, in the wood beyond the water, a flame leapt up, probably somebody lighting a wood fire. And he thought of plundering dragons settling on his quiet hill and kindling at all the flames. He shuddered. And very quickly he was playing Mr. Bag Ends of Bag End again. He got up trembling. He had less than half a mind to fetch a lamp, and more than half a mind to pretend to and go and hide behind the beer barrels in the cellar and not come out again until all the dwarves had gone away. Suddenly he found that the music and singing had stopped, and they were all looking at him with eyes shining in the dark. Where are you going? What about a little light? We like the dark. Dark for dark business. There are many hours before dawn. Oh, of course. Now let Thorin speak. Gandalf, <clears throat> dwarves, and Mr. Baggins, we are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator, this most excellent and audacious hobbit. May the hair on his toes never fall out. All praise to his wine and ale. <laughs> <laughs> What's yeah. this fellow conspirator? Audacious hobbit. Hmm. We are met to discuss our plans, our ways, means, policy, and devices. We shall soon, before the break of day, start on our long journey. A journey from which some of us, or perhaps all of us, may never return. It is a solemn moment. Our object is, I take it, well known to us all. I believe he's fainted. Strike a light, somebody. Excitable little fellow gets funny queer fits. But he's one of the best, one of the best, as fierce as a dragon in a pinch. Will he do? 
do you think? Oh, of course, of course. Why, his ancestor, Bull Roarer, charged the ranks of the goblins of Mount Graham in the Battle of the Green Fields and knocked their King Golfimble's head clean off with a wooden club. <laughs> it sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> and in this way, the battle was won and the game of golf invented at the same moment. <laughs> 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 well, one shriek like that in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives and kill the lot of us. As soon as I clapped eyes on the little fellow bobbing and puffing on the mat, I had my doubts. He looks more like a grocer than a burglar. I think he's coming too. B burglar? That's right. Let's have no more argument. I've chosen Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. You asked me to find the 14th man for your expedition, and I chose Mr. Baggins. You can stop at 13, if you like, and have all the bad luck, or go back to digging coal. Oh, uh, if I say he's a burglar, a burglar he is, or will be when the time comes. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar, if you like. I like that, I like that. Yes, there's a lot more in him than you guess, and a deal more than he has any idea of himself. You may possibly all live to thank me yet. Oh, no, Bilbo, fetch the lamp and let's have a little light on this map. This was made by Thor, your grandfather, Thorin. It's a plan of the mountain. I don't see that this will help us much. I remember the mountain well enough and the lands about it. And I know where Mirkwood is and the withered heath where the great dragons breed. There is a dragon marked in red on the mountain. <laughs> but it'll be easy enough to find him without that if ever we arrive there. <laughs> There's one point that you haven't noticed, and that's the secret entrance. Oh. It may have been secret once, but how do I know that it's secret any longer? Old Smog has lived there long enough now to find out anything there is to know about those caves. He may, but he can't have used it for years and years. Why? Because it's too small. Five feet high the door, and three may walk abreast, say the runes on the map. But Smog couldn't creep into a hole that size, not even when he was a young dragon. That's true. Certainly not after devouring so many of the dwarves and men of Dale. It seems a great big hole to me. How could such a large door be kept secret from everybody outside apart from the dragon? Oh, in lots of ways. From what it says on the map, I should guess there's a closed door which has been made to look exactly like the side of the mountain. That's the usual dwarves' method. Yeah. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Quite right, quite right. right. Yes. Well, also, I forgot to mention that with the map went a key. Huh? Yes, a small, curious key. Oh. Uh, let me see. Here, here, here it is. Oh. Now keep it safe, Thorin. Indeed I will. Well, now things begin to look more hopeful. Supposing our burglar expert gives us some ideas or suggestions. First, I should like to know a bit more about things. I mean, about the gold and the dragon and all that, and, and how it got there, and who it belongs to, and so on and further. Well, bless me, haven't you got a map? And didn't you hear our song? And haven't we been talking about all this for hours? All the same, I should like everything plain and clear. I should like to know about risks, out-of-pocket expenses, time required and remuneration, and so forth. Oh, he wants to know what he's going to get out of it, and if he'll come back alive. Very well. Long ago, in my grandfather Thror's time, our family was driven out of the far north and came back with all their wealth and their tools to this mountain on the map. They mined and they tunneled, and they made huge halls and great workshops. And in addition, I believe they found a good deal of gold and a great many jewels, too. I remember that. Anyway, they grew immensely rich and famous, and my grandfather was king under the mountain again. 
His halls became full of armor and jewels and carvings and cups, and the toy market of Dale that was built nearby by mortal men was the wonder of the North. Mm, but the toy market... Now, undoubtedly, that... Oh, yes, that was what brought the dragon. Dragons steal gold and jewels, you know, from men and elves and dwarves, wherever they can find them. And they guard their plunder as long as they live, which is practically forever unless they're killed, and never enjoy a brass ring of it. Now, there was a most specially greedy, strong, and wicked worm called Small. So one day, he flew up into the air and came south. The first we heard of it was a noise like a hurricane coming from the north and the pine trees on the mountain creaking and cracking in the wind. Well, from a good way off, we saw the dragon settle on our mountain in a spout of flame. Then he came down the slopes, and when he reached the woods, they all went up in fire. By that time, all the bells were ringing in Dale, and the warriors were arming, and the dwarves rushed out of their great gate. But there was the dragon waiting for them. Not one escaped that way. The river rushed up in steam, and a fog fell on Dale. And in the fog, the dragon came on them and destroyed most of the warriors. Then he went back and crept in through the front gate and routed out all the halls and lanes, tunnels, alleys, cellars, mansions, and passages. After that, there were no dwarves left alive inside. And he took all their wealth for himself. That was a terrible time. Probably... For that is the dragon's way. He's piled it all up in a great heap far inside and sleeps on it for a bed. Well, after that we went away. But we've never forgotten our stolen treasure. And we still mean to get it back. And to bring our curses home to Smog. Now we have the map and key to the secret door. We shall succeed in our burden. Yes! Gandalf, I should like to know how you got hold of the map. I didn't get hold of it. I was given it. Your grandfather, Thor, was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Azog the Goblin. Oh. Curse his name, yes. Yes, and Thrain, your father, went away on the 21st of April, a hundred years ago, last Thursday, and has never been seen by you since. Oh. True, true. Well, your father gave me this to give. To you. Wow, this is awesome. I don't understand. Well, I found your father a prisoner in the dungeons of the necromancer. No, and one whatever were you doing there? Never you mind. I was finding things out as usual. I tried to save your father, but it was too late. He was witless and wandering, and had forgotten almost everything except the map and the key. We have long ago paid the goblins of Moria. We must now give a thought to the necromancer. Don't be absurd. He's an enemy quite beyond the powers of all the dwarves put together. The dragon and the mountain are more than big enough tasks for you. Here, here. Here what? what? Well, I should say that you ought to go to the east and have a look round. After all, there is the side door, and the dragons must sleep sometimes, I suppose. If you sit on the doorstep long enough, I dare say you'll think of something. Now, what about bed and an early start and all that? I'll give you a good breakfast before you go. Before we go, I suppose you mean, uh, aren't you the burglar? Huh. And... Isn't sitting on the doorstep your job? And not to speak of getting inside the door. Hmm? But I agree about bed and breakfast. I like six eggs with my ham when starting on a journey. Fried, not poached. And mind you, don't break them. I won't eat a broken egg. I'd like some porridge in the morning and a little milk. After all the others had ordered their breakfasts without so much as a please, they all got up. The hobbit had to find room for them all, and filled all his spare rooms and made beds on chairs and sofas before he got them all stowed and went to his own little bed, very tired, 
and not altogether happy. As he lay in bed, he could hear Thorin still humming to himself in the best bedroom next to him. Far over the misty mountains go to dungeons deep and caverns old. We must away ere break of day to find our long forgotten gold. Bilbo went to sleep with that in his ears and it gave him very uncomfortable dreams. It was long after the break of day when Bilbo woke up. There was nobody about but all the signs of a large and hurried breakfast. There was a fearful mess in the room and piles of unwashed crocks in the kitchen. Nearly every pot and pan he possessed seemed to have been used. Still, he could not help feeling just a trifle disappointed. Oh, don't be a fool, Bilbo Baggins, thinking of dragons and all that outlandish nonsense at your age. You should be delighted that they have all gone without you. Uh, I'll just sit down to a nice little My breakfast. My dear fellow, whenever are you going to come? What about an early start? It's half past ten. They left you the message because they couldn't wait. What message? Great elephants. You're not at all yourself this morning. You've never dusted the mantelpiece. What's that got to do with it? I've enough to do with washing up for fourteen. If you dusted the mantelpiece, you'd have found this note just under the clock. Huh? Thorin and Company to Burglar Bilbo greetings. Yes. For your hospitality, our sincerest thanks, and for your offer of professional assistance, our grateful acceptance. Terms, cash on delivery, up to and not exceeding one-fourteenth of total profits, if any, all traveling expenses guaranteed in any event, funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representatives, if occasion arises and the matter is not otherwise arranged for, thinking it unnecessary to disturb you, we have proceeded in advance to make preparations and shall await your respected person at the Green Dragon Inn by water at 11 a.m. sharp. Trusting that you will be punctual, we have the honor to remain yours deeply, Thorin and company. Yes, and that leaves you... Let me see. Just ten minutes. You'll have to run. But... No time for it. But... No time for that either. Off you go. Uh, uh, oh, dear, oh, dear. To the end of his days, Bilbo could never remember how he found himself outside without a hat, walking stick, or any money, or anything that he usually took when he went out running as fast as his furry feet could carry him down the lane, past the great mill, across the water, and then on for a whole mile or more, Bilbo got to Bywater just on the stroke of eleven. There were the dwarves on ponies, and each pony was slung about with all kinds of baggage, packages, parcels, and paraphernalia. There was a very small pony, apparently for Bilbo. Bravo! Here comes Baggins! <laughs> Up, you get, and off we go! I'm awfully sorry. I've come without my hat, and I've left my pocket handkerchief behind, and I haven't got any money. I didn't get your note until after 10.45, to be precise. Don't be precise, and don't worry. You'll manage without pocket handkerchiefs and a good many other things before you get to the journey's end. As for a hat, I've got a spare hood and cloak in my luggage. And off we go! <laughs> That's how they all came to start, jogging off from the inn one fine morning just before May on laden ponies. They hadn't been riding very long when up came Gandalf, very splendid on a white horse. He had brought a lot of pocket handkerchiefs and Bilbo's pipe and tobacco. So after that, the party went along very merrily. 
and they told stories or sang songs as they rode forward all day, except, of course, when they stopped for meals. At first, they passed through Hobbit lands, a wild, respectable country inhabited by decent folk with good roads, an inn or two, and now and then a dwarf or a farmer ambling by on business. Then they came to lands where people spoke strangely and sang songs Bilbo had never heard before. At last, they came to the lone lands, where there were no people left, no inns, and the roads grew steadily worse. Not far ahead were dreary hills rising higher and higher, dark with trees. On some of them were old castles with an evil look as if they had been built by wicked people. Everything seemed gloomy, for the weather had taken a nasty turn. Still, the dwarves jogged on, and then it began to rain, and the wind got up, and the willows along the river bank bent and sighed. Somewhere behind the gray clouds, the sun must have gone down, for it began to get dark. I'm sure the rains got into the dry clothes and into the food bags. Father burgling and everything to do with it. I wish I was at home in my nice hole by the fire with the kettle just beginning to sing. Well, let's stop for supper and see if we can find a dry patch to sleep on. Hey, where's Gandalf? Oh, he isn't here. Just when a wizard would have been most useful. Well, we'll have to do without him. Owen and Glowen, see if you can get a fire started. All right. Look. There's a light over there. No, I don't think so. Yes, there it is, through the trees. These parts are none too well known, and the less inquisitive you are as you go along, the less trouble you're likely to find. Yes. After all, there are 14 of us. Where has Gandalf got to? Listen, haven't we got a burglar with us? Yes. Well, it's his turn. Yes. Now you Good. must go and find out about that light. And what it's for. And if all is perfectly safe and canny. Now scuttle off and come back quick if all's well. If not, come back if you can. Mm-hmm. If you can't, hoot twice like a barn owl and once like a screech owl and we'll do what we can. Not cut out for this sort of Off thing. Bilbo had to go before he could explain that he couldn't hoot even once like any kind of owl any more than fly like a bat. But at any rate, hobbits can move quietly in woods, absolutely quietly. They take a pride in it. So naturally, he got right up to the fire, for fire it was without disturbing anyone. Three very large persons were sitting round a very large fire of beech logs. They were toasting mutton on long spits of wood and licking the gravy off their fingers. Even Bilbo, in spite of his sheltered life, could see that they were trolls. Obviously, trolls. That's good. Uh, mutton yesterday, mutton today, and skunks if it don't look like mutton again tomorrow. Yeah, never a blink of man flesh if we had for long enough. What the hell William was a thinking of to bring us in these parts at all beats me. Now shut your mouth. You can't expect folk to stop here forever just to be et by you and Bert. No. You've had a village and a half between years since we come down from the mountains. Time's been up our way when you'd have said, Oh, thank you, Bill, for a nice bit of fat valley mutton like what this is. Uh, ah. What should I do? I can't go back to Thorn and company empty-handed. Maybe I'll just slip the purse out of William's pocket. Ha! Huh. It's a beginning. Hey, what's this? Oh, blimey, Bert! Look what I've come. What is it? Blimey, if I knows. What are yous? Bilbo Baggins, a bur, uh, hobbit. A bur, a hobbit? 
Uh, what's a hobbit got to do with my pocket, anyways? Uh, huh? Can you cook him? Ah, <laughs> you can try. <laughs> uh, he wouldn't make more in a mouthful, not when he was skinned and boned. Perhaps uh, they're more like him roundabout, and we might make a pie. Are there any more of your sort uh, sneaking in these here woods, you nasty little rabbit? Uh, yes, lots. Uh, no, 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 none at all. No, no, what do you one. mean? Lots and none at all. Uh, just what I say. And please don't cook me, kind sirs. I'm a good cook myself and cook better than I cook, if you see what I mean. <laughs> ah, poor little blighter. Let him go. Not till he says what he means by lots and none at all. Hold his toes in the fire till he talks. I won't have it. I caught him anyways. You're a fat fool, Williams, I've said afore this evening. And you're a lou. I won't take that from you, Bill Huggins. No, you no, don't. Don't. I don't. take what I give you. No, no, you two. Oh, no, don't. Keep on fighting. There was a gorgeous row, and soon the trolls were locked in one another's arms and rolling nearly into the fire, kicking and thumping, while Tom whacked at them both with a branch to bring them to their senses. And that, of course, only made them madder than ever. Right in the middle of the fight, up came Balin. No sooner did Tom see him come into the light than he slapped a sack over his head. Oh, there's more to come yet, boys, or I might have mistook lots and none at all it is. No barabits, but lots of these here dwarves. That's about the shape of it. I reckon you're right, and we'd best get out of the light. Yar, I simply detest the sight of dwarves. And caught. <laughs> With sacks in their hands, they waited in the shadows. As each dwarf came up and looked at the fire, pop, went a nasty, smelly sack over his head and he was down. After some fighting, for dwarves fight like mad when they're cornered, all of them were neatly tied up in sacks with three angry trolls sitting by them arguing whether they should roast the dwarves slowly or mince them fine and boil them, or just sit on them one by one and squash them into jelly. Bilbo was hiding in a bush where he had escaped during the struggle. It was just then that Gandalf came back. No one saw him, but the wizard saw them. Knowing how trolls liked to argue, Gandalf decided to keep them bickering and fighting by imitating the voices of the trolls. They were about to roast the dwarves now and eat them later, which was Bert's idea, and after a lot of argument, they had all agreed to it. No good roasting them now. It'll take all night. Don't start the argument all over again, Bill, or it'll take all night. Who's the arguing? You are. You're a liar. Now get roasting them then and let's boil them. Oh, now you're making sense. No good boiling them. We ain't got no water and it's a long way to the well and all. Shut up, Tom, or I'd never get done. And you can fetch the water yourself if you say any more. Shut up yourself. Who's arguing but you, I'd like to know? You're a booby. Booby yourself. Now let's sit on the sacks one by one and squash them and boil them later. Who shall we sit on first? Better sit on the last fellow first. Which is he? The one with the yellow stocking. Nonsense, the one with the grey stocking. I made sure it was yellow. Yellow is what? Then what did you say grey for? I never did. Tom said it. I did not, it was you. Two to one, so shut your mouth. Who are you talking to? Dawn take you all and be stone to you. Just at that moment, the light came over the hill and there was a mighty twitter in the branches. William never spoke, for he stood turned to stone as he stooped, and Bert and Tom were stuck like rocks as they looked at him. And there they stand to this day, all alone, unless the birds perch on them, for trolls, as you probably know, must be underground before dawn, or they go back to the stuff of the mountains they are made of and never move again. Just then, Gandalf stepped from behind a tree and helped Bilbo to climb down out of a thorn bush. It was the wizard's voice that had kept the trolls bickering and quarreling until the light came and made an end of them. The next thing was to untie the sacks and let out the dwarves. How did you get caught in the first place, burglar baggins? 
Mm. Well, I was trying to lift the wallet out of William's pocket and... Silly time to go practicing pinching and pocket picking when what we wanted was fire and food. And that's just what you wouldn't have got of those fellows without a struggle in any case. Well, let's not waste time. The trolls must have a cave or a hole dug somewhere near to hide from the sun. Good, Killy. Now, if we can find a way to open the big door of stone... Would this key be any good? I found it on the ground where the trolls had their fight. Why on earth didn't you mention it before? Give it to me! <laughs> what a mess. Bones all over the floor. Phew. <sighs> what a nasty smell. <sighs> I'm afraid it's the bones of their victims. Oh. And what do we have here? Swords. <gasps> Look at the beautiful oh. scabbards and jeweled hilts. Oh. They weren't made by any troll nor by any smith among men in these parts and days. When we can read the runes on them, we shall know more about them. I'll keep this one, and you keep that one, Gandalf. Here, Bilbo. This is a small knife which may serve as a short sword for a hobbit. Let's get out of this horrible smell. Yes, let's leave this Bring place. out some of that food, then we'll eat and rest before going on. Where did you go to, if I may ask? Oh, to look ahead, to look ahead. Yeah, yeah, and what brought you back in the nick of time? Oh, looking behind, looking behind. Now, could you be more plain? I went on to spy out our road when I met a couple of friends of mine from Rivendell, Elrond's people. They told me that three trolls had come down from the mountain and settled in the woods not far from the road. I immediately had a feeling that I was wanted back. I saw a fire in the distance and made for it, so now you know. Uh, please be more careful next time or we shall never get anywhere. Thank you. They did not sing or tell stories that day, nor the next day, nor the day after that. They camped under the stars, and their horses had more to eat than they had. A great mountain, dark and drear, lay before them. There were patches of sunlight on its brown sides, and behind its shoulders the tips of snow peaks gleamed. Is that the mountain? Of course not! It's only the beginning of the Misty Mountains. We've got to get through or over or under it somehow before we can come into Wilderland beyond. And it's a deal of a way, even from the other side of it, to the lonely mountain in the east where smog <laughs> lies on your treasure. Right. Oh. Now, we mustn't miss the road, or we'll be done for. We need food, for one thing, and rest in reasonable safety. Where will we find that? Oh, hidden somewhere ahead of us is the fair valley of Rivendell, where Elrond lives. Gandalf led the way through unexpected valleys, narrow with deep sides. There were gullies they could almost leap over, but very deep with waterfalls in them. There were dark ravines that one could neither jump nor climb into. There were bogs, some of them green, pleasant places to look at with flowers growing bright and tall. But a pony that walked there with a pack on its back would never have come out again. Bilbo's pony began to stumble over roots and stones in the gathering darkness. They came to the edge of a steep fall in the ground so suddenly that Gandalf's horse nearly slipped down the slope. Here it is at last! Hmm, smells like elves. Down they went into the valley below. Bilbo never forgot the way they slithered and slipped in the dusk down the steep zigzag path into the secret valley of Rivendell. 
They stayed long in the good house of Elrond, 14 days at least, and they found it hard to leave. Bilbo would gladly have stopped there forever and ever, for Elrond's house was perfect, whether you liked food or sleep or work or storytelling or singing or just sitting and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture of them all. Evil things did not come into that valley. One day, just before they left on their journey, Elrond looked at the swords they had brought from the troll's cave. Uh, these are not troll make. They are old swords, very old swords of the high elves of the west, my kin. They were made in Gondolin for the Goblin Wars. Mm. Uh, whence did the trolls get them, I wonder? Mm, they must have come from a dragon's horde or, or goblin plunder. And the trolls had plundered the plunderers. And what do the runes say? This sword, Gandalf, was Glamdring, the foe hammer, which the king of Gondolin once wore. This Thorin, the runes named Orchrist, the goblin cleaver. It was a famous blade. Keep it well. I will keep this sword in honor. May it soon cleave goblins once again. <laughs> I wish that is likely to be granted soon enough in the mountains. But uh, show me your map. Here it is. Hmm, ah, uh, what is this? There are moon letters here, besides the plain runes which say, uh, Five feet high the door, and three may walk abreast. What are moon letters? Well, moon letters are rune letters, but you cannot see them, not when you look straight at them. They can only be seen when the moon shines behind them. And what is more, with a more cunning sort, it must be a moon of the same shape and season as the day when they were written. The dwarfs invented them and wrote them with silver pens. What do they say? Stand by the gray stone when the thrush knocks and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. Durin? Durin? He was the father of the fathers of the eldest race of dwarves, the Longbeards, and my first ancestor. I am his heir. Then what is Durin's day? The first day of the dwarves' new year. It is the first day of the last moon of autumn. We still call it Durin's day when the last moon of autumn and the sun are in the sky together. Is there any more riding? None to be seen by this moon. The next morning was a midsummer's morning as fair and fresh as could be dreamed. Blue sky and never a cloud and the sun dancing on the water. Now they rode away amid songs of farewell and good speed, with their hearts ready for more adventure, and with a knowledge of the road they must follow over the misty mountains to the land beyond. There were many paths that led up into the Misty Mountains, and many passes over them. The dwarves and the hobbit, helped by the wise advice of Elrond and the knowledge and memory of Gandalf, took the right road to the right pass. Long days after they had climbed out of the valley and left Rivendell miles behind, they were still going up and up and up. It was a hard pass and a dangerous path, crooked and lonely and long. Far, far away in the west, where things were blue and faint, Bilbo knew there lay his own country of safe and comfortable things and his little hobbit hole. Summer's getting on down below, and haymaking is going on, and picnics. They'll be harvesting and blackberrying before we even begin to go down the other side at this rate. Oh, it's cold up here. One day they met a thunderstorm. 
more than a thunderstorm, a thunder battle. The lightning splintered on the peaks, and great crashes split the air and went rolling and tumbling into every cave and hollow. The darkness was filled with overwhelming noise and sudden light. They were camped high up in a narrow place, sheltering under a hanging rock. Across the valley, the stone giants were out, hurling rocks at one another for a game, and catching them, and tossing them down into the darkness where they smashed among the trees far below, or splintered into little bits with a bang. This won't do at all. If we don't get blown off or drowned, or struck by lightning, we'll be picked up by some giant and kicked sky high for a football. Well, if you know of anywhere better, take us there. Feely and Keely have gone to search for better shelter. They should return soon. There they are, holding on to the rocks in the wind. We found a dry cave. Mm. Not, not far round the next mm. corner. Ponies and all could get inside. Have you thoroughly explored it? Yes, yes. It, it isn't all that big and it doesn't go far back. All right, let's go. And carefully. Quite a fair size. Not too large and mysterious. I'll just light my wand and look around a bit. Put the ponies over at that end. At least it's dry. And out of the wind. It seems safe enough. What about a fire to dry our clothes? No fires. Spread your wet things on the floor and take some dry clothes from your bundle. Lay out the blankets and let's get some sleep. When they were comfortable, they dropped off to sleep one by one. But somehow Bilbo could not go to sleep for a long while. And when he did sleep, he had very nasty dreams. He dreamed that a crack in the wall at the back of the cave got bigger and bigger and opened wider and wider. And then he dreamed that the floor of the cave was giving way and he was slipping, beginning to fall down, down. At that he woke up with a horrible start and found that part of his dream was true. A crack had opened at the back of the cave and was already a wide passage. He was just in time to see the last of the ponies disappearing into it. It was goblins, big goblins, ugly-looking goblins, lots of goblins, six to each dwarf at least, and two even for Bilbo. They were all grabbed and carried through the crack, all except Gandalf. When goblins came to grab him, there was a terrific flash like lightning in the cave, a smell like gunpowder, and several goblins fell dead. The crack closed with a snap. Bilbo and the dwarves were on the wrong side of it. The goblins seized Bilbo and the dwarves and hurried them along the dark passageway. The goblins began to croak, keeping time as they went. The black crack. Grip. Grab. Pinch. Nab. Down, down, the goblin town you go, my lad. <laughs> Amber and tongs. Knocker and guns. Pound, pound. The higher underground. How, oh, my life. <laughs> <laughs> Swish, swish, yeah. whip, crack. Batter and me. Yammer and me. Round and round. <laughs> it sounded truly terrifying. 
the general meaning of the song was only too plain. And now the goblins took out their whips and cracked them and whooped as they drove their captives along. Finally, they stumbled into a big cavern lit by a great red fire in the middle and by torches along the walls. It was full of goblins laughing, stamping, and clapping their hands. There, in the shadows on a large flat stone, sat a tremendous goblin with a huge head, and armed goblins stood round him carrying axes and bent swords. Who are these miserable persons? Dwarves and beasts. <laughs> Let go of me. We found them sheltering in our front porch. What do you mean by it, dwarves? Up to no good? Spying on the private business of my people, I guess. <laughs> Thieves I shouldn't be surprised to learn. Murderers and friends of elves, not unlikely. Come, what have you got to say? Thorin the dwarf at your service. <laughs> we sheltered from a storm in what seemed a convenient cave and unused. Nothing was further from our thoughts than disturbing goblins in any way. Whatever. Uh, so you say. Might I ask what you were doing up in the mountains at all? And where you were coming from? And where you were going to? In fact, I should like to know all about you. Not that it will do you much good, Thorano can shield. I know too much about your folk already. But let's have the truth, or I'll prepare something particularly uncomfortable for you. <laughs> We were on a journey to visit our relatives who live on the east side of these truly hospitable mountains. He's a liar, oh truly tremendous one! Several of our people were struck by lightning in the cave when we <laughs> invited these creatures to come below. <laughs> and they are as dead as stone. Uh, also, he has not explained this sword. Murderers and elf friends, uh, it is the sword we call Biter, which the elves call Orchrist. Uh, it has killed hundreds of goblins in its time. Uh, Take these dwarves away to dark holes full of snakes uh, and never let them see the light again. Uh, them. Right. them. Suddenly, all the lights in the cabin went out, and the great fire went off, shoof, right up to the roof. Then piercing white sparks scattered among the goblins, burning holes in them. Suddenly a sword flashed in its own light. Bilbo saw it go right through the great goblin as he stood dumbfounded in the middle of his rage. He fell dead, and the goblin soldiers fled before the sword, shrieking into the darkness. Follow me, quick! Yes, we must hurry. The torches will soon be relit. Are we all here? Let me see. One, that's Thorin. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Where are Keely and Feely? Here we are. Ah, twelve, thirteen. And here's Mr. Baggins. Fourteen. Well, well, it might be worse, and then again it might be a good deal better. No ponies and no food and no knowing quite where we are and hordes of angry goblins just behind. On we go! On they went. Gandalf was quite right. They began to hear goblin noises and horrible cries far behind in the passage as they had come through. Since poor Bilbo could not possibly go half as fast as the dwarves, they took it in turn to carry him on their backs. 
Still, goblins go faster than dwarves, and these goblins knew the way better. They chose out their very quickest runners with the sharpest ears and eyes. These ran forward as swift as weasels in the dark, and with hardly any more noise than bats. Quite suddenly, Dory, now at the back again, carrying Bilbo, was grabbed from behind in the dark. He shouted and fell, and the hobbit rolled off his shoulders into the blackness, bumped his head on hard rock, and remembered nothing more. You've been listening to The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, adapted for radio by Bob Lewis, and featuring Ray Reinhardt as Bilbo, Bernard Mays as Gandalf, Tom Luce as Thorin, Carl Haig as Elrond, and Gail Chug as the narrator. Also heard in the cast were Pat Franklin and Joe Hughes. The Hobbit, Part 2, by J. R. R. Tolkien. Bilbo opened his eyes, he wondered if he had, for it was just as dark as with them shut. He could hear nothing, see nothing, and he could feel nothing except the stone of the floor. Very slowly he got up and groped about on all fours till he touched the wall of the tunnel. But neither up nor down it could he find anything, nothing at all. No sign of goblins, no sign of dwarves. He crawled along for a good way, till suddenly his hand met what felt like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his career, but he did not know it. It feels like a ring. Hmm. Well, I'll just put it in my pocket. It certainly doesn't seem of any particular use at the moment. Oh, I wish I was home in my own kitchen, frying bacon and eggs. Ah, oh, well, at least I've still got my pipe. It's not broken. And here's my tobacco pouch. Oh, I haven't got any matches. It's just as well. Goodness knows what the striking of matches and the smell of tobacco would bring on me out of the dark holes in this horrible place. Well, here's my little sword. It shines pale and dim like Thorin's and Gandalf's swords, so it, it's an elvish blade, too, and goblins are not very near, or it would shine brighter. Now, what should I do? Go back? No good at all. Go forward? Only thing to do? On we go. On and on he went, and down and down, hating to go on, not daring to stop. And suddenly, without any warning, he trotted splash into water. Oh, 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 oh it's icy cold. Oh, it's an underground pool or lake. Well, I can't go on, that's certain. There are strange things living in the pools and lakes in the hearts of mountains. Nasty, slimy things with big, bulging, blind eyes wriggling in the water. Now what'll I do? As Bilbo sat on the brink of the underground lake, altogether flummoxed and at the end of his way and his wits, a slimy creature called Gollum watched him from a tiny rock island in the middle of the lake. Gollum, as dark as darkness, except for two big round pale eyes in his thin face. He had a little boat and he rode about quietly on the lake with large feet dangling over the side, looking out of his pale lamp-like eyes for blind fish, which he grabbed with his long fingers as quick as thinking. He liked meat, too. Goblin, he thought, good when he could get it. But he took care they never found him out. He just throttled them from behind if they ever came down alone anywhere near the edge of the water while he was prowling about. Gollum got into his boat and shot off from the island and silently came to where Bilbo sat. Oh. 
Mr. Bilbo Baggins. I've lost the dwarves, and I've lost the wizard, and I don't know where I am, and I don't want to know if only I can get away. Um, what's he got in his hands? A sword. A, a blade which came out of Gondolin. Perhaps he sits here and chats with it a bit, see, my precious. It likes riddles. Perhaps it does. Does it? Gollum. When he said Gollum, he made a horrible swallowing noise in his throat. That's how he got his name, though he always called himself My Precious. Does Baggins like riddles, does it? Very well, but you ask the first riddle. What has roots as nobody sees? Is taller than trees, up, up it goes, and yet never grows. Easy. Mountain, I suppose. <laughs> Does it guess easy? It must have a competition with us, my precious. If Precious asks, and Baggins doesn't answer, we sit, my Precious. <laughs> if Baggins asks us, and we doesn't answer, then we does what it wants. Eh, we show Baggins the way out. Yes. All right. Here's a riddle. Thirty white horses on a red hill. First they champ, then they stamp, then they stand still. Teeth. Teeth, my precious. But we has only six. Here's another riddle for Bagginses. Voiceless it cries, wingless flutters, toothless bites, mouthless mutters. Hmm. Uh, half a moment. Uh, uh, wind. Wind, of course. This'll puzzle the nasty little underground creature. Uh, listen to this riddle. An eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face. That eye is like to this eye, said the first eye, but in low place, not in high place. My precious columns. Sun on the daisies, it means it does. All right, it's your turn. It cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelt. It lies behind stars and under hills 
and empty holes it fills. It comes first and follows after, ends life, kills laughter. Oh. Ah, Doc, that's it, Doc. Here's one for you. A box without hinges, key or lid, yet golden treasure inside is hid. Well, what is it? The answer's not a kettle boiling over, as you seem to think from the noise you're making. Give us a chance. Let it give us a chance, my precious. Well, what about your guess? Eggs. Eggs as it is. Now, here's a riddle for Baggins. Alive without breath, as cold as death. Never thirsty, ever drinking, all in mail, never clinking. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> Is it nice, my precious? Is it juicy? Is it scrumptiously crunchable? Column. Half a moment. I gave you a good long chance just now. It must make haste. Haste. What's that? Oh, it's a fish. That's it. Fish. Fish. It's a fish. That's the answer to your riddle. Now it's got to ask us a question, my precious. Uh, let's see, uh, mm, uh, um, ask us, ask us, uh, uh, what have I got in my pocket? <laughs> Not fair. Not fair. It isn't fair, my precious, to ask us what it's got in its nasty little pocket says. What have I got in my pocket? It must give us three guesses, my precious. Three guesses. Very well. Guess away. Hands. Wrong. Guess again. Come. Knife. Wrong. Last guess. Come. Come on, I'm waiting. Time's up. String on nothing. Both wrong. Well, what about your promise? I want to go. You must show me the way. <gasps> Did we say so, precious? Show the nasty little baggins the way out. Yes. Yes. But what has it got in its Bucket says, Glowton. Never you mind. A promise is a promise. We can't go up tunnel so hasty. We must go and get some things first. Yes, things to help us. Well, hurry up. My birthday present. That's what we want now. Yes, we want it. And the nasty little baggins can't see us. And its nasty little sword will be useless. Gollumness. Where 
precious is loss. Precious and precious loss. What's the matter? What have you lost? In Bersadaskas, not its business, it's lost. Gollum, Gollum, Gollum. Well, so am I, and I want to get unlost, and I, I, I won the game, and, and you promised, so come along. Oh, not yet. We must search for it, Gollum. But you never guessed my last question, and you promised. Never guessed? What has it got in its bucket, says? Tell us that! Answers were to be guessed, not given. And that wasn't a fair question, not a riddle. What has it got? I asked you a question first. What have you lost? Tell me that. Now the light in Gollum's eyes had become a green fire and it was coming swiftly nearer. Gollum was in his boat again, paddling wildly back to the dark shore. Such a rage of loss and suspicion was in his heart that no sword had any more terror for him. Bilbo could not guess what had maddened the wretched creature, but he saw that Gollum meant to murder him. He turned and ran blindly back up the dark passage down which he had come, wondering what it was that he had in his pocket. The ring felt very cold as it quietly slipped onto his groping forefinger. The hiss was close behind him. He turned now and saw Gollum's eyes like small green lamps coming up the slope. Terrified, he tried to run faster, but suddenly he struck his toes on a snag in the floor and fell flat with his little sword under him. In a moment, Gollum was on him. But before Bilbo could do anything, Gollum passed by, taking no notice of him, cursing and whispering as he ran. Curse the baggins! What has it got in its pockets? Oh, we guess! We guess, my precious gum! My birthday present! We guess as precious! Only guesses! We can't know till we find the nasty creature and squeeze at it! Bilbo pricked up his ears. What could it mean? Gollum could see in the dark, yet he passed by as if he did not see the hobbit. Bilbo was at last beginning to guess himself. He hurried a little, keeping close to the creature who was still going quickly, not looking back, but turning his head from side to side, looking for Bilbo. It doesn't know what the present can do, does it? It will just keep it in its pockets. It's, it doesn't know, and it can't go far. Phew! The goblins as well catch it. <laughs> goblins as come if the nasty baggins has got the present. Oh, a precious present. And goblins as will get it. Shan't ever be safe again. Never. The goblin says, we'll put on the ring, and then no one will see him. He'll be there, but not seen. He'll come creepsy and tricksy and catch us. Come, come. The nasty Baggins knows a way in. It must know a way out, yes. It's off to the back door. To the back door, that's it. With a spring, Gollum got up and started shambling off at a great pace. Bilbo hurried after him, still cautiously. 
His head was in a whirl of hope and wonder. It seemed that the ring he had was a magic ring. It made you invisible. He had heard of such things, of course, in old, old tales. But it was hard to believe that he had really found one by accident. Still, there it was. Gollum, with his bright eyes, had passed him by only a yard to one side. On they went, Gollum flip-flapping ahead, hissing and cursing, Bilbo behind, going as softly as a hobbit can. Soon they came to places where, as Bilbo had noticed on the way down, side passages opened this way and that. Gollum began at once to count them. One left, yes. One right. Two right, yes, yes. Two left. Three right. Four right. Yes, yes, yes. Seven right, yes. Six left. Yes, this is it. This is the way to the back door. Here's the passage. But we dursn't go in, precious snow. We dursn't. Goblins is down there. Lots of goblins. We smells them. Bilbo crept forward silently and saw Gollum sitting humped up right in the opening. His eyes gleamed cold in his head as he swayed it from side to side between his knees. As Bilbo crept nearer, Gollum stiffened at once and sniffed, and his eyes went green. He hissed softly but menacingly. He could not see the hobbit, but now he was on the alert, and he had other senses that the darkness had sharpened, hearing and smell. Bilbo almost stopped breathing and went stiff himself. He was desperate. He must get away out of this horrible darkness while he had any strength left. He trembled. And then, quite suddenly, in a flash, as if lifted by a new strength and resolve, he leaped straight over Gollum's head. Gollum threw himself backwards and grabbed as the hobbit flew over him, but too late. His hands snapped on thin air, and Bilbo, falling fair on his sturdy feet, sped off down the tunnel. He's smelt them, then they'll have heard his shrieking and cursing. Be careful now, or this way will lead you to worse things. What's that? A light ahead. Not red light from a fire or a lantern, but a pale out-of-doors sort of light. It's sunshine. Scuttling as fast as his legs would carry him, he came to a large open space where a leak of sunshine came through a doorway, where a great door, a stone door, was left standing partly open. Bilbo blinked, and then suddenly he saw the goblins. Goblins in full armor with drawn swords sitting just inside the door. They saw him sooner than he saw them. The ring was not on his finger. With yells of delight, the goblins rushed upon him. He stuck his hands into his pockets, and there was the ring, still in his left pocket. It slipped on his finger, and the goblins stopped short. Where is it? Go back up the passage. This way. Look out of the door. I must get to the door. I must get to the door. Then it was like a horrible game of blind man's buff. The place was full of goblins running about, and the poor little hobbit dodged this way and that, was knocked over by a goblin, slipped between the legs of the captain, got up and ran for the door. He tried to squeeze through the crack. He squeezed and squeezed, and he stuck. He could see outside into the open air, but he couldn't get through. Something's outside. Bilbo's heart jumped into his mouth. He gave a terrific squirm. 
buttons burst off in all directions. He was through. Bilbo had escaped. Bilbo had escaped the goblins, but he did not know where he was. He had lost hood, cloak, food, pony, his buttons, and his friends. He wandered on and on till the sun began to sink westwards behind the mountain. Good heavens! I seem to have got right to the other side of the misty mountains, right to the edge of the land beyond. Where can Gandalf and the dwarves have got to? I only hope they're not still back there in the power of the goblins. I wonder if I should go back to look for them. I've got the ring, but those horrible, horrible tunnels. But it's my duty. I must turn back. What's that? Doesn't sound like goblins. Over in that dell, under the bushes, people are talking. Ah, there's a red hood. It's Balin doing lookout. I'll give them all a surprise. I've still got the ring on. We can't go on without Mr. Baggins. We can't just leave him in the hands of the goblins. He's been more trouble than you so far. We might have chosen someone with more sense. No, he's not a bad little chap. I wish to goodness you hadn't lost him. If we have to go back now into those abominable tunnels to look for him, then drat him, I say. I brought him, and I don't bring things that are of no use. Whatever did you want to go and drop him for, Dory? You would have dropped him if a goblin had suddenly grabbed your leg from behind in the dark, tripped up your feet, and kicked you in the back. Then why didn't you pick him up again? Good heavens! Goblins fighting and biting in the dark, everybody falling over bodies and hitting one another. You nearly chopped off my head with glandering and Thorin was stabbing here and there and everywhere with Orchrist. All of a sudden you gave one of your blinding flashes and we saw the goblins running back yelping. You shouted, follow me everybody! And everybody ought to have followed. There was no time to count as you know quite well till we dashed through the gate guards and out the lower door. And here we are without the burglar confusticating. And here's the burglar. Oh. Oh. Mr. Baggins! <laughs> Balin, come here and tell me what kind of a lookout man lets people walk right in without a warning. Well, it appears Mr. Baggins is a first-class burglar after all, huh, Balin? Uh, I can't believe it. Baggins, how did you do it? Oh, just crept along, you know, very carefully and quietly. Well, it's the first time that even a mouse has crept along carefully and quietly under my very nose and not been spotted. I take off my hood to you. Bolin, at your service. Your servant, Mr. Baggins. What did I tell you? Mr. Baggins has more about him than you guess. After Bilbo had explained his adventures in the tunnels of the goblins and his encounter with Gollum, though he didn't tell them about the ring just yet, Gandalf told how he had worked his magic and allowed everyone to escape during the fireworks. Then he called everyone to the task at hand. We must be getting on at once. Now we're a little rested. They'll be out after us in hundreds when night comes on. Already the shadows are lengthening. They can smell our footsteps for hours and hours after we've passed. We must be miles away before dark. I'm dreadfully hungry. I can't help it unless you like to go back and ask the goblins nicely to let you have your pony back and your luggage. No, thank you. Uh, very well, then. We must just tighten our belts and trudge on, or we shall be made into supper. And that'll be much worse than having none ourselves. Mum, 
must we go any further? My toes are all bruised and bent, and my legs ache, and my stomach is wagging like an empty sack. I can't see a thing. A bit further. Wolves! What will we do? Escaping goblins to be caught by wolves? Up the trees, quick! Over there! Place. You've left the burglar behind again, Dory! Oh, why can't we always carry burglars on my back down tunnels and up trees? What do you think I am, a porter? He'll be eaten if we don't do something. Be quick, Dory, and give Mr. Baggins a hand up. Dory was really a decent fellow in spite of his grumbling. He actually climbed out of the tree and let Bilbo scramble up and stand on his back and climb into the tree. Just as the wolves trotted into the clearing, Dory jumped for the branches himself, only just in time. These wolves are called wogs in the wild and they often join in wicked deeds for the goblins. At least they can't climb trees. And they're afraid of fire, so let's see how they like a burning pine cone. Ah! Ah, there! Here's another with bright blue fire. Yeah! And red! No, green! Ah, take that! Aha! Look! Look! Through the tree! The glint of the moon on the goblin spears and helmets! Oh, no. How could they have followed us already? No doubt they had already planned for a raid tonight and we just happened to be at their meeting place! Oh. Ah. Oh. The wargs have caught some birds! <laughs> Fly away, little birds! <laughs> Fly away if you can. <laughs> Why don't we roast these birds in their nest? Yeah! Good idea. Roast them. Go away, little boys. Naughty little boys that play with fire get punished. Sack the fern and brushwood round the tree trunk. <laughs> Sing, little birds. Why don't you sing? <laughs> That's it. Put the leaves and get branches on the ground. <laughs> the flames were leaping up into the trees. The bark caught on fire and the lower branches cracked. Gandalf and the others climbed to the tops of the trees. A sudden splendor flashed from Gandalf's wand like lightning as he got ready to spring down among the dancing goblins. But he never leaped. Just at that moment, a gigantic shadow swept down from above, and the Lord of the Eagles seized Gandalf in his talons and was gone. The great birds that were with him came like huge black shadows. Their beating wings smote the goblins to the ground or drove them far away. Their talons tore at goblin faces. Other birds flew to the treetops and seized the dwarves who were scrambling up as far as they dared to go. Poor Bilbo was nearly left behind again. He just managed to catch hold of Dory's legs as Dory was borne off last of all. They were all carried to a wide shelf of rock on the mountainside. The Lord of the Eagles was there speaking to Gandalf. He had heard the commotion in the forest below and had gone to see what mischief the goblins were doing. Gandalf, as it turned out, had once rendered a service to the eagles and healed their lord from an arrow wound. Saving Gandalf and the others had been one good turn for another. Food was then brought, which the dwarves prepared, 
and soon Bilbo's stomach was feeling full and comfortable again. So ended the adventures of the Misty Mountains. That night, Bilbo slept curled up on the hard rock more soundly than ever he had done on his feather bed in his own little hole at home. But all night he dreamed of his own house and wandered in his sleep into all his different rooms looking for something that he could not find nor remember what it looked like. The next morning, Bilbo woke up with the early sun in his eyes. He jumped up to look at the time and to go and put his kettle on and found he was not home at all. He was still on the wide shelf of rock high in the mountains. After a breakfast of cold mutton and rabbit, Bilbo and the others made ready for a fresh start. With the sun still close to the eastern edge of things, Fifteen great birds rose from the mountainside and carried them to a great rock jutting out from a distant valley below. Quickly now, to the top of this rock, the eagles swooped one by one and set down their passengers. Then away they flew. There was a flat space on the top of the hill of stone and a well-worn path with many steps leading down it to the river, across which a ford of huge flat stones led to the grassland beyond the stream. Well, I always meant to see you all safe, if possible, over the mountains, and now by good management and good luck, I've done it. Right. Indeed, we're, we're now a good deal further east than I ever meant to come with you. For after all, this is not my adventure. No, oh, I may look in on it again before it's all over, but in the meantime, I have some other pressing business to attend to. No, I'm not going to disappear this very instant. I can give you a day or two more. We have no food and no baggage and no ponies to ride, and you don't know where you are. That's true. Yes, I can tell you that. Very few people live in these parts, but there is somebody that I know of who lives not far away. That somebody made the steps on the great rock there. You see, the Carrack, I believe he calls it. Who calls it? Uh, the somebody I spoke of. A very great person. I'll introduce you slowly, oh, two by two. And you must be careful not to annoy him. He could oh. be appalling when he's angry. Couldn't you find someone more easy-tempered? Couldn't you make it a bit clearer? Yes. Who is this somebody? If you must know more, his name is Bjorn. He's very strong, and he's a skin changer. Huh? Skin changer? Yes, he's a skin changer. He changes his skin. Sometimes he's a huge black bear. Sometimes he's a great, strong, black-haired man with huge arms and a great beard. Oh. I can't tell you much more. As a bear, he ranges far and wide. I once saw him sitting all alone on the top of the carrack at night, watching the moon sinking towards the misty mountains, and I heard him growl in the tongue of the bears. Well, we'd better be moving. We've a long walk before us. I don't want to. so hard and hungry. With all those clover fields and bees, there must be a lot of honey nearby. Yes, Bjorn keeps hives and hives of great fierce bees. Uh, if one was to sting me, I'd swell up as big again as I am. I've never seen such bees. We're on the edge of his bee pastures. Ah, I see that thorn hedge. His place is just beyond. There's a gate over there. Now, you dwarves had better wait here. When I call or whistle, begin to come after me, but only in pairs, mind, about five minutes between each pair of you. Bomber is fattest and, and will do for two. He'd better come alone and last. Come on, Mr. Baggins. 
The wizard and the hobbit went off along the hedge until they came to a wooden gate, high and broad, beyond which they could see gardens and a cluster of low wooden buildings, some thatched and made of unshaped logs. There were barns, stables, sheds, and a long, low wooden house. On the southward side of the great hedge were rows and rows of hives with bell-shaped tops made of straw. They pushed open the heavy, creaking gate and went down a wide track towards the house. Some horses, very sleek and well-groomed, trotted up across the grass and looked at them intently with very intelligent faces. Then off they galloped to the building. They've gone to tell Bjorn of the arrival of strangers. Soon they reached a courtyard. In the middle, there was lying a great oak trunk with many lopped branches beside it. Standing near was a huge man with thick black beard and hair and great bare arms and legs with knotted muscles. The horses were standing by him with their noses at his shoulder. <laughs> Here they are. <laughs> they don't look dangerous. You can be off. <laughs> Well, who are you, and what do you want? I am Gandalf. Never heard of him. No. And what's this little fellow? Uh, that's Mr. Baggins, a, a hobbit of good family and unimpeachable reputation. Hmm. I am a wizard. I have heard of you, if you haven't heard of me. Uh, perhaps you've heard of my good cousin Radagast, who lives near the southern borders of Mirkwood. Yes, not a bad fellow, as wizards go, I believe. Ah. Well, now I know who you are, or who you say you are. What do you want? Well, to tell you the truth, we've lost our luggage and nearly lost our way, and are rather in need of help, or at least advice. I may say we've had rather a bad time with goblins in the mountains. Goblins? Yes. Oh, so you've been having trouble with them, have you? What did you go near them for? Oh, we didn't mean to. They surprised us at night in a pass which we had to cross. Uh, we were coming out of the lands over west into these countries. It's a, it's a long tale. Well, then you'd better sit down and tell me some of it, if it won't take all day. Certainly. Well, I was, I was coming over the mountains with a friend or two. Or two? I can only see one. And a little one at that. Oh, well, to tell you the truth, I didn't like to bother you with a lot of us until I found out if you were busy. <clears throat> uh, I'll give a call, if I may. Go on, call away. As I was saying, I was coming over the mountains with a friend or two. Or three, you mean. But these two coming aren't hobbits. They're dwarves. For in Oakenshield, at your service. Um... Dory, at your service. I don't need your service, thank you. But I expect you need mine. I'm not over fond of dwarves. But if it's true you're Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thor, I believe, and that you're enemies of goblins, and are not up to any mischief in my lands... What are you up to, by the way? Oh, they're on their way to visit the land of their fathers, away east uh, beyond Mirkwood, and it's entirely an accident that we're in your lands at all. Uh, we were crossing by the High Pass when we were attacked by the evil goblins, uh, as I was about to tell you. Go on telling, well, then. But then there was a terrible storm. The stone giants were out hurling rocks, and at the head of the pass we took refuge in a cave, the Hobbit and I, and no. Oh, Several of our companions. Do you call two several? Well, no. As a matter of fact, there were more than two. Well, where are they? Killed? Eaten? Gone home? Well, no. Uh, they don't seem all to have come when I whistled. Shy, I expect. Go on, whistle again. I'm in for a party, it seems. And one or two more won't make any difference. <laughs> they came pretty quick. Where were you hiding? Come on, my jack in the boxes. <laughs> Nori at your service. Oriet. Thank you. When I want your help, I'll ask for it. Sit down and let's get on with this tale, or it'll be supper time before it's ended. Oh, well, as soon as we were asleep, a crack at the back of the cave opened. Goblins came out and grabbed the hobbit and the dwarves and our troop of ponies. Troop of ponies? What were you, at circus? Or were you carrying lots of goods? 
Or do you always call six a troop? Oh, no. As a matter of fact, there were more than six ponies, for there were more than six of us, and, and we well, here are two more. <laughs> troop was right. A fine comic one. Come in, my merry men. And what are your names? I don't want your service just now. Only your names. Balin. <laughs> um, Dwalin. No. Go on with your story, wizard. Uh, where was I? Uh, oh, yes. I was not grabbed. I killed a goblin or two with a flash. Good. It's some good being a wizard, then. <laughs> and slipped inside the crack before it closed. I followed down the main hall, which was crowded with goblins. The great goblin was there with thirty or forty armed guards. I thought to myself, what can a dozen do against so many? A dozen? That's the first time I've heard eight called a dozen. Or have you still got some more jacks that haven't yet come out of their boxes? <laughs> well, yes, uh, there seem to be a couple more here now. Uh, a Feely and Keely, I believe. Well, that's enough bowing and smiling. Sit down and be quiet. Now, go on, Gandalf. Well, I performed a bit of wizardry and caused the fire to fly up to the ceiling and then fall upon the goblins, allowing us to escape. After a lot of running, we counted ourselves and found that there was no hobbit. There were only fourteen of us left. Fourteen? Well, that's the first time I've heard one from ten leave fourteen. Oh. You mean nine, or else you haven't told me at all the names of your party. Well, of course, you haven't seen Owen and Glowin yet. <laughs> and bless me, here they are. I hope you'll forgive them for bothering you. Oh, let them come. Let them all come. Hurry up. Come along, you two, and sit down. But look here, Gandalf. Even now we've only got yourself and ten dwarves and the hobbit that was lost. That only makes eleven, plus one mislaid, and not fourteen, unless wizards count differently to other people. But please, get on with the tale. Well, we finally all escaped and made our way to the woods far from the goblins. But then a pack of wogs forced us to climb some trees. I, I tried to drive them off with some fireworks. Well, I wish I'd been there. I'd have given them more than fireworks. Oh, well, uh, I did the best I could. There we were, with the wolves going mad underneath us and the forest beginning to blaze in places when goblins came down from the hills and discovered us. They yelled with delight and made fun of us. Fifteen birds in five fir trees, they shouted. Good heavens! Yes. Don't pretend that goblins can't count. They can. What? Twelve isn't fifteen, and they know it. <laughs> and so do I. There were Biffa and Beaufort as well. I haven't ventured to introduce them before, but here they are now. Oh, and here's Bomber, too. Well, now there are fifteen of you. Yeah. And since goblins can count, I suppose that's all there were up in the trees. Now, perhaps we can finish this story without any more interruptions. <laughs> Bilbo saw how clever Gandalf had been. The interruptions had really made Bjorn more interested in the story, and the story had kept him from sending the dwarves off at once like suspicious beggars. Bjorn never invited people to his house, but now he'd got fifteen strangers sitting on his porch. When Gandalf finished his tale, Bjorn was pleased and invited them all to supper. After a splendid meal, they all went to bed on mattresses of straw laid at the side of Bjorn's great hall. Once in the night when Bilbo awoke, he heard a growling sound outside, a noise as of some great animal scuffling at the door. The next morning both Bjorn and Gandalf were gone. The wizard came back late that night but still they saw nothing of their host. But the following morning they were awakened by Bjorn himself. So here you are still, not eaten up by wargs or goblins or wicked bears yet, Mr. Baggins. Little Bunny is getting nice and fat again on bread and honey, eh? Well, come and have some more. <laughs> you probably wonder where I've been. I've been over the river and right back up into the mountains. 
It was a good story you told Gandalf, but I like it still better now I'm sure it's true. Ah. I'll give you ponies to take you to the edge of Mirkwood. They're already packed with food to last for several weeks. Nuts, flour, sealed jars of dried fruits, and red earthenware pots of honey. And there are skins for water. Water? The way through Mirkwood is dark, dangerous, and difficult. Water's not easy to find there. Ah. There's one stream there, I know, black and strong, which crosses the path. That you should neither drink of nor bathe in, for it carries enchantment of great drowsiness and forgetfulness. Is there any other advice you can give us? Yes. Whatever you do, do not stray from the path. Now, I wish you all speed, and my house is open to you if ever you come back this way again. After their final meal with Bjorn, the little group set out again following the directions given them by their host. For four days they traveled through pleasant fields and woods until they came to the borders of a great forest. There were no animals to be seen. Birds began to sing less. Ahead were gigantic trees, their trunks huge and gnarled, their branches twisted, their leaves dark and long. Ivy grew on them and trailed along the ground. Well, here is Mirkwood, the greatest of the forests of the northern world. I hope you like the look of it. Now you must send back those excellent ponies you borrowed. Oh, why must we send them back just when we need them most? Oh. Bjorn is not as far off as you seem to think. And you'd better keep your promises, for he's a bad enemy. Let Mr. Baggins tell you what he saw last night. I thought it was the shadowy form of a great bear prowling along in the same direction as we are going. Ah, <laughs> Mr. Baggins' eyes are sharper than yours. Bjorn has been with us to guide you and guard you and to keep an eye on his ponies, too. You don't guess what kindness he has shown you in letting dwarves ride them so far and so fast, nor what would happen to you if you tried to take them into the forest. What about the horse he's loaned to you? What? You don't mention sending him back. I don't, because I'm not sending him. What about your promise, I'm then? I'm not sending the horse back. I'm riding it. Oh, no, 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 I've told you before. I have pressing business, and I'm already late through bothering with you people. Oh, now we may meet again before all is over, and then again, of course, we may not. No, 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 I'm sending Mr. Baggins with you. I've told you before that he has more about him than you guess, and you'll find that out before long, so cheer up. Now, goodbye, Thorin. And goodbye to you all. Straight through the forest is your way now. Don't stray off the track. If you do, it's a thousand to one. You'll never find it again and never get out of Mirkwood. Do we really have to go through? Yes, you do. If you want to get to the other side, you must either go through or give up your quest. Oh. And I'm not going to allow you to back out now, Mr. Baggins. I'm ashamed of you for thinking of it. You've got to look after all these dwarfs for me. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't mean that. I meant, is there no way round? Oh, there is, if you care to go 200 miles or so out of your way north, and twice that south. Before you could get round Mirkwood in the north, you would be right among the slopes of the Grey Mountains. And they're simply stiff with goblins, hobgoblins, and orcs of the worst description. Orcs, wouldn't you say? Yes, yes. Now, before you could get rounded in the south, you'd get into the land of the necromancer. Oh, no. Yes, and even you, Bilbo, won't need me to tell you tales of that black sorcerer. I don't advise you to go anywhere near the places overlooked by his dark tower. Stick to the forest track. Keep your spirits up. Hope with the best, 
and with a tremendous slice of luck, you may come out one day and see the long marshes lying before you, and beyond them, high in the east, the lonely mountain where dear old Smog lives, though I hope he isn't expecting you. Very comforting you are, to be sure. Yes. Goodbye. If you won't come with us, you'd better get off without any more talk. Well, goodbye, then. Goodbye. Bye. Take care of yourself. Bye. And don't leave the pub. Oh, you always tell us how to Goodbye, goodbye, and go away. Soon the wizard was out of sight. Now began the most dangerous part of all the journey. They each shouldered the heavy pack and water skin which was their share, and turned from the light that lay on the lands outside, and plunged into the forest of Mirkwood. You've been listening to The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, adapted for radio by Bob Lewis, and featuring Ray Reinhardt as Bilbo, Gail Chug as Gollum and the narrator, Tom Luce as Thorin, and Bernard Mays as Gandalf. Also heard in the cast were Carl Haig, Bob Lewis, and Joe Hughes. The Hobbit, Part 3, by J.R.R. Tolkien. They walked in single file. The entrance to Mirkwood was like an arch leading into a gloomy tunnel made by two great trees that leaned together, too old and strangled with ivy and hung with lichen to bear more than a few blackened leaves. The path itself was narrow and wound in and out among the trunks. Soon the light at the gate was like a little bright hole far behind and the quiet was so deep that their feet seemed to thump along while all the trees leaned over them and listened. Occasionally a slender beam of sun that had the luck to slip in through some opening in the leaves far above, and still more luck in not being caught in the tangled boughs and matted twigs beneath, stabbed down thin and bright before them. Bilbo's sharp, inquisitive eyes caught glimpses of black squirrels whisking off the path and scuttling behind tree trunks. There were queer noises, too. Grunts, scufflings, and hurryings in the undergrowth, and among the leaves that lay piled endlessly thick in places on the forest floor. But what made the noises, he could not see. The nights were even worse. It was so black that you really could see nothing almost nothing. They could see eyes. They slept all closely huddled together and took it in turns to watch. When it was Bilbo's turn, he would see eyes in the darkness round them, and sometimes they would gleam down from the branches just above him, horrible, pale, bulbous eyes. Insect eyes, not animal eyes, only they're much too big. They tried lighting watchfires at night, but they soon gave it up. It seemed to bring hundreds and hundreds of eyes all round them. Worse still, it brought thousands of dark gray and black moths, some nearly as big as your hand, flapping and whirring round their ears. So they gave up fires and sat at night and dozed in the enormous, uncanny darkness. All this went on for what seemed to the hobbit ages upon ages, and he was always hungry and thirsty. Then one day they found their path blocked by a running water. This must be the river Bjorn spoke of. The river of forgetfulness. <laughs> <laughs> 
Look at this. There's been a bridge across, but it's rotted and fallen. There's a boat against the far bank. Now, why couldn't it have been this side? How far away do you think it is? Not at all far. I shouldn't think above 12 yards. 12 yards? I, I should have thought it was 30 at least. But my eyes don't see as well as they did a hundred years ago. Still, 12 yards is as good as a mile. We can't jump it. And we certainly don't want to try to swim it after what Bjorn told us. Can any of you throw a rope? Oh, that's the good of that. The boat sure to be tied up even if we could hook it, which I doubt. I don't believe it's tied, though of course I can't be sure in this light. Dory's the strongest, but Feely's the youngest, and he has the best sight. Come here, Feely. Mm -hmm. See if you can see the boat Mr. Baggins is talking about. Uh, uh, I, I think I can make it out. Well, bring up one of the ropes yes. and fasten a packing hook to the end. Uh, now you guide the throw, Mr. Baggins. All right, all right. Now, here, here it goes. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Ah, uh, that's it. Straight over there. Uh, oh, not far enough. No. A couple of feet, you would have dropped it onto the boat. Now try again. I don't suppose the magic is strong enough to hurt you if you just touch a bit of wet rope. I hope not. Well, here goes again. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, steady. Uh, you've thrown it right into the wood on the other side. Uh, now, now, draw it back gently, carefully. It's lying on the boat. Uh, Let's hope the hook will catch. I think he caught. I think he caught. Now, now, yeah, help me pull. Come on up. Uh, 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 there it comes. Grab it, Mr. Balin. Good. Well, ha, it was tied after all. That was a good pull, my lads. And a good job that our rope was the stronger. Who'll cross first? I right? shall. And you'll come with me, and Feely, and Balin. That's as many as the boat will hold at a time. After that, Keely, and Owen, and Glowen, and Dory. The next Dory, Nori, Biffer, and Bofer. And last, Dwalin, and Bomber. I'm always last, and I don't like it. It's somebody else's turn today. Don't start grumbling against orders or something bad will happen to you. Mm. Mm. Ah, here's the last of our party now. I don't like this, being last all the time. Uh, careful, Bomber, or you'll swamp the boat. I won't. Bomber's fallen in. He'll drown. Quick, don't let him throw him the rope. Put it in the water. Throw him back. Good. He's got it. Now, pull. That's it. Pull him out. There we are. Pull him Is out. he dead? No. He, he's asleep. And smiling. It's just the work of the enchanted stream. Well, we'll just have to carry him. Oh, no. Bomber? Why, he's as heavy as any two of us. We can't leave him here. Four will carry him. The others will share the supplies. Oh, yes. yes. They were a gloomy party that started again along the dark path beyond the enchanted stream. For days they struggled, burdened with the heavy body of Bombor, who smiled in his sleep as if he no longer cared for all the troubles that vexed them. Is there no end to this accursed forest? Let's rest here for a time. Look, Bomber's beginning to move. Oh, where are we? Mm. What's become of Mr. Baggins' house? We were just having a splendid party. We're a long way from Bag End, my friend, though I wish we were there. You fell into the stream four days back. 
and I've been sleeping ever since. Oh, what stream? Where are we? The enchanted stream that's made you forget everything that happened since we started on our quest. Well, if I could have something to eat, perhaps my memory would return. Oh, I'm starved. I wish there was something to eat, but the provisions are gone. Even the water. Oh. Why ever did I wake up? I was having such beautiful dreams. I dreamed I was walking in a forest like this one, only lit with torches on the trees. And there was a great feast going on, going on forever. A woodland king was there with a crown of leaves, and there was merry singing. Oh, I couldn't count or describe the things they were to eat and drink. You needn't try. In fact, if you can't talk about something else, you'd better be silent. Oh. We're quite annoyed with you as it is. Now take your share of the supplies, such as they are, and let's get started before we all starve to death. Go ahead. I'm just going to lie here and sleep and dream of food if I can't get it any other way. Oh, I hope I never wake up again. What was that? I thought I saw a twinkle of light in the forest. A light? Where? Oh, 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 oh I, I see it too. Off to the left of the path. Yes. Torches and fires are burning under the trees a good way off. It looks as if my dreams are coming true. Come on. Wait. Wait. A feast would be no good if we never got back alive from it. But without a feast, we shan't remain alive much longer anyway. All right. I remember only too well the warnings of the wizard and of Bjorn about leaving the path. But we must do something. Now, all stay together and keep a sharp eye out. Oh, look, it is a feast. Oh, smell the roast meat. Let's join them. Food, food, food. As the hungry travelers scrambled forward into the circle of light with the one idea of begging for some food, all the lights went out as if by magic. They were lost in a completely lightless dark, and they could not even find one another. Not for a long time, at any rate. Have, have, have we found everyone now? Now stay close. Let's take a count. One, two, three, four. Is that you, Mr. Baggins? Yes, I think so. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Only thirteen. And you're fourteen. I'm fourteen. Yes, quite right. So, we're all here. We'll just have to wait until morning to find the path. Look, the, the lights are coming out again over there. No rushing forward this time. I shall send Mr. Baggins alone first to talk to them. They won't be frightened of him. Remember, no one is to stir from hiding till I say... When they got to the edge of the circle of lights, they pushed Bilbo suddenly into the full blaze of the fire and torches. Out went all the lights again, and complete darkness fell. Oh, no, no, no. Bilbo found himself running round and round and calling and calling. Balin! Dory! Nori! Thorin! Oakenshield! But the cries of the others got steadily farther and fainter. And though after a while it seemed to him they changed to yells and cries for help in the far distance, all noise at last died right away, and he was left alone in complete silence and darkness. So he sat himself down with his back to a tree, and not for the last time fell to thinking of his far distant hobbit hole with its beautiful pantries. He was deep in thoughts of bacon and eggs and toast and butter when he felt something touch him. 
Something like a strong, sticky string was against his left hand. And when he tried to move, he found that his legs were already wrapped in the same stuff, so that when he got up, he fell over. What in the deuce? Let go of me! Get away! It was a great spider who had been busy tying him up. He could only see the thing's eyes, but he could feel its hairy legs as it struggled to wind its abominable threads round and round him. Then he remembered his sword and drew it out. The spider jumped back, and Bilbo had time to cut his legs loose. After that, it was his turn to attack. He struck with his sword right in the eyes. The great spider went mad and leaped and danced and flung out its legs in horrible jerks. The spider lay dead beside him, and his sword blade was stained black. Somehow the killing of the giant spider all alone by himself in the dark without the help of the wizard or the dwarves or of anyone else made a great difference to Mr. Baggins. He felt a different person and much fiercer and bolder in spite of his empty stomach. Sword, I will give you a name. I shall call you Sting. Now we had better go to the aid of the dwarves. But first, I'll just slip on the ring in the event we meet any more spiders. So, with sword in hand, Bilbo picked his way stealthily in the direction from which the cries for help had come. At last he came upon a group of loathsome spiders who were speaking one to another. They were talking about the dwarves. Was a sharp struggle, but worth it. <laughs> what nasty thick skins they have. But I'll wager there's good juice inside. <laughs> <laughs> they make fine eating when they've hung a bit. Don't hang them too long. They're not as fat as they might be. Kill them, I say. Kill them now and hang them dead for a while. Dead, dead, no. No, I saw one struggling just now. I'll show you. See this fattest one here. Whoa. No, it's the dwarves hanging in a row from that branch. That's poor old Bumber, I'll bet. The giant spider nipped hard at the nose that stuck out between the threads. Bumber yelled, and a toe shot up and kicked the spider straight and hard. There was a noise like the kicking of a flabby football, and the enraged spider fell off the branch, only catching itself with its own thread just in time. <laughs> You're right, the meat's alive and kicking. I, I soon put, a, put an end to that. The angry spider climbed back onto the branch, Bilbo saw that he must do something. He was a pretty fair shot with a stone, and finding several lying nearby, he found some nice, smooth, egg-shaped ones. Just as the spider reached Bombo, Bilbo threw. The stone struck the spider, plunk on the head, and it dropped senseless off the tree, flopped to the ground with all its legs curled up. The next stone went whizzing through a big web, snapping its cords and taking off the spider sitting in the middle of it. Whack! Dead! They couldn't see Bilbo, but they could make a good guess at the direction from which the stones were coming. As quick as lightning, they came running and swinging towards the hobbit, flinging out their long threads in all directions till the air seemed full of waving snares. Bilbo slipped away to a different place, and began throwing more stones and shouting. Old fat spider spinning in a tree. Old fat spider can see me. At a cup, at a cup, won't you stop? Stop your spinning and look for me. Old Tom Nutty, all big body. Old Tom Nutty can spy me. At a cup, at a cup, down you drop. You'll never catch me up your tree. Practically all the spiders in the place came after him. They were frightfully angry. Quite apart from the stones, no spider has ever liked being called Attercop. And Tom Noddy, of course, is insulting to anybody. When he had drawn the spiders farther and farther away from the dwarves, he yelled again, Lay below! 
love and crazy carb are weaving webs to wind me. I'm far more sweet than other meat, but still they cannot find me. Here am I, naughty little fly, you are fat and lazy. You cannot trap me, though you try, in your cobwebs crazy. Again he dashed off with the spiders after him. Then, quieter than a mouse, he stole back to free the dwarves. He quickly scrambled up one of the spider ropes hanging from the tree, only to meet an old, slow, wicked, fat-bodied spider who had remained behind to guard the prisoners and had been pinching them to see which was the juiciest to eat. Before the spider knew what was happening, it felt the hobbit sting and rolled off the branch dead. Then Bilbo began to cut away the threads wound round the first bundle. Most likely Feely. There. Well, it is Feely. You look like one of those funny toys bobbing on a wire. Boy, I don't feel at all well, Mr. Baggins. I should think not, what with the spider oh. poison and hanging half the night in this tree. Yes. Now give me a hand with the others. The spiders will be back in a minute. All right. Between them, they started to haul up first one dwarf and then another and slash them free. There were still five dwarves hanging at the end of the branch when the spiders began to come back, more full of rage than ever. Bilbo had taken off his ring when he rescued Feely, so now they all began to splutter and hiss. Now we see Willie, chew and leave your bones and skin hanging on a tree. Yes, we will. Cut the others free while I keep the spiders off. Come down. Don't stay up there and be netted. They're swarming up all the neighboring trees. With hundreds of angry spiders goggling at them all round and about and above, it looked pretty hopeless. But some of the dwarves had knives and some had sticks and all of them could get at stones and Bilbo had his elvish dagger. <laughs> Again and again, the spiders were beaten off, and many of them were killed. There are too many, and we're too weak. Listen, I'm going to disappear. I'll draw the spiders off if I can and make in the opposite direction. Now go! Soon Bilbo shouted from the trees on the right. That upset the spiders greatly. They stopped advancing and went off in the direction of the voice. But the dwarves were sick and weary, and they could not go much better than a hobble and a wobble. Soon the creatures were overtaking them, and already some spiders were in the trees above them and throwing down their long, clinging threads. Then suddenly Bilbo appeared and charged into the astonished spiders from the side. Go on! Go on! I'll do the stinging! He darted backwards and forwards, slashing at spider threads, hacking at their legs, and stabbing at their fat bodies if they came too near. And just when Bilbo felt that he could not lift his hand for a single stroke more, the spiders suddenly gave it up and followed them no more, but went back disappointed to their dark colony. When the hobbit joined the dwarves, they all lay for some time puffing and panting. But very soon they began to ask questions, and Bilbo had to explain the whole vanishing business carefully from the Gollum story, riddles and all, to the present. The dwarves had changed their opinion of Mr. Baggins very much, and had begun to have a great respect for him, as Gandalf had said they would. Finally, just as they were all falling asleep, Dwalin opened an eye and looked round at them. Where's Thorin? Oh, Thorin is gone! It was a terrible shock. Of course, there were only thirteen of them, twelve dwarves and the hobbit. Where indeed was Thorin? They wondered what evil fate had befallen him, magic or dark monsters, and shuddered as they lay lost in the forest. There they dropped off, one by one, into uncomfortable sleep full of horrible dreams.
During the battle with the spiders and throughout the long night of troubled dreams, Thorin Oakenshield was in the dungeon of the Wood Elves. Separated from the others in the dark, he had been captured and dragged to the cave of the king, who commanded that the dwarf be brought before him. Why did you and your folk try to attack my people at their merrymaking? We did not attack them. We came to beg because we were starving. Where are your friends now, and what are they doing? I don't know, but I expect starving in the forest. What were you doing in the forest? Looking for food and drink because we were starving. But what brought you into the forest at all? Very well. Take him away and keep him safe until he feels inclined to tell the truth, even if he waits a hundred years. The following day, the other dwarves were also captured, all except Bilbo, who popped on his ring and slipped quickly to one side when the wood elves called the dwarves to halt. He followed the elves and their prisoners to the king's cave and slipped inside before the great gates closed behind them with a clang. The prisoners were brought before the elven king, who looked grimly at the dwarves. Unbind them. They need no ropes in here. There is no escape from my magic doors for those who are once brought inside. What have we done, O king? Is it a crime to be lost in the forest, to be hungry and thirsty, to be trapped by spiders? Are the spiders your tame beasts or your pets, if killing them makes you angry? It is a crime to wander in my realm without leave. Do you forget that you are in my kingdom, using the road that my people made? You have troubled my people and roused the spiders with your riot and clamor. Now, what brings you here? Take them to prison until they have learned sense and manners. Each dwarf was put in a separate cell, and none was told that Thorin was also a prisoner of the king. It was Bilbo who found that out. After a week or two of sneaking about with the ring on, Bilbo managed to find out where each dwarf was kept. What was his surprise one day to overhear some of the guards talking and to learn that there was another dwarf in prison too, in a specially deep, dark place? He guessed at once, of course, that it was Thorin. Psst. Thorin Oakenshield, are you inside? Mr. Baggins, is that you? Yes, it is. Are you all right? Poor prisoner. Are the others safe? They're locked in cells like this. How did you escape, Mr. Baggins? And how did you find me? I'll tell you all about it later. I have a plan to set us all free. The gates are locked by magic, but there's another way out. A stream flows under the king's cellar, and the elves cover it with trap doors, which they open to bring in supplies that are shipped up the river. And how are we to escape from the cells? I haven't found out yet, but be ready to go when I discover a way. For some time Bilbo thought about the water gate and wondered if it could be used for the escape of his friends. Huge empty barrels sat beside the trap doors, ready to be pushed into the river where they floated back to Lake Town at the end of Long Lake. Bilbo began to form a desperate plan. Then he heard the king's butler bidding the chief of the guards good night. Oh, but come with me and taste the new wine that has just come in. It's good, good. I, I'll be hard at work tonight, clearing the cellars of the empty barrels. So let's have a drink first to help the labor. Very good. Yeah. I'll taste with you. Yeah, and good. see if it's fit for the king's table. Ah. There's a feast tonight, and it not do to send up poor stuff. No, 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 <laughs> right, quite right, quite right. <laughs> When he heard this, Bilbo was all in a flutter, for he saw that luck was with him, and he had a chance at once to try his desperate plan. Soon they began to drink and laugh merrily. <laughs> it must be potent wine to make a wood elf drowsy, but the chief guard is nodding his head. Very soon he laid it on the table and fell fast asleep. 
The butler went on talking and laughing to himself without seeming to notice, but soon his head too nodded to the table, and he fell asleep and snored beside his friend. Now to get the keys. But what are we going to do? No time now. Just follow me. But I will... Keep together and stay out of sight. We've got to free Thorin. He's the last one, and his cell is not far from the cellars. I don't know why we're going this way. Don't argue. There's a good fellow. Psst. Thorin. Mr. Baggins. Come out quietly. Upon my word. Gandalf spoke true as usual. A pretty fine burglar you make, it seems, when the time comes. Follow me and stay together. I'm sure we're all of your service, whatever happens after this, Mr. Baggins. This way. Thorin. This way, this way, this way. Here we are, the king's cellars. Now what comes next? We'll put one in each of these empty barrels, and when they're thrown into the river and float away from the cave, we'll be free. We'll be bruised and battered to pieces. And drowned for certain. We thought we had got some sensible notion when you managed to get hold of the keys. This is a mad idea. Very well. Come along back to your nice cells, and I'll lock you all in again, and you can sit there comfortably and think of a better plan. No, I'm not going to back to the cell at all. Well, it, it might work. We could put straw around us to protect us. And holes in the end for air. All right, Mr. Baggins. We'll try your plan. There was little time to lose. Before long, as Bilbo knew, some elves would come to help the butler get the empty barrels through the doors into the stream below. They soon found thirteen with room enough for a dwarf in each. At last they were all stowed. Thorin turned and twisted in his tub and grumbled like a large dog in a small kennel. Balin's lid had been fitted on when Bilbo heard the sound of voices and saw the flicker of lights. <laughs> Where's old Gallion the butler? I didn't see him at the tables tonight. He ought to be here now to show us what's to be done. I'll be angry if the old slow coach is late. I'm no wish to waste time down here while the song is up. Ah, there's the old villain with his head on a jug. He's been having a little feast with his friend the captain. Jacob. Wake up. Come on now, old friend. Oh, 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 you're all late. Here I am, waiting and waiting down here while you fellows drink and make merry and forget your tasks. Small wonder I fall asleep from weariness. No. Come give us a taste of your sleeping draught before we begin. <laughs> why, why, Galia, your feasting early has muddled your wits. What? You've stacked some full casks here instead of the empty once, if there's anything in way. Oh, get on with the work. There's nothing in the feeling of white and weak arms like yours. These are the ones to go into the stream and no others. Very well, very well. Uh, on your head be it, if the king's full butter tubs and his best wine go into the river. Go, go, go. Down went the barrels into the stream, one after another, with many a clash and a bump, thudding on top of ones below, smacking into the water, jostling against the walls of the tunnel, knocking into one another, and bobbing away down the current. It was just then that Bilbo discovered the weak point in his plan. How was he to escape? And what would happen to the dwarves without him? As the very last barrel was being rolled to the doors, he caught hold of it and was pushed over the edge with it. Down into the water he fell, splash into the cold, dark water with the barrel on top of him. He came up again, spluttering and clinging to the wood like a rat. But for all his efforts, he couldn't scramble on top. The trap doors fell to with a boom, and the voices of the elves faded away. 
He was in the dark tunnel, floating in icy water, all alone, for you cannot count friends that are all packed up in barrels. Finally, the barrels passed out of the tunnel into the open stream. When the barrel he was holding stuck against some hidden roots, Bilbo crawled on top and lay spread out to keep the balance. Down the river he went in the midst of the barrels. They had escaped from the wood elves, but whether alive or dead still remains to be seen. It was a good thing Bilbo kept his ring on while he floated down the river on the barrels. For when they came to shallow water running slow and smooth, several elves were busy making up a raft of barrels, lashing them together to steer them down to Lake Town. They did not know, of course, that they were helping the dwarves escape, nor did they know there was a hobbit riding with them on the raft. The day grew lighter and warmer as they floated along, Suddenly the cliff fell away, the shores sank, the trees ended, and there, far away, its dark head in a torn cloud loomed the mountain. All alone it rose and looked across the marshes to the forest. The lonely mountain. Bilbo had come far and through many adventures to see it, and now he did not like the look of it in the least. It seemed to frown at him and threaten him as it drew ever nearer. Late in the afternoon they came to the long lake, and there was the strange town he had heard the elves speak of in the king's cellars. It was not built on the shore, but right out on the surface of the lake. It was a busy wooden town, not a town of elves, but of men who still dared to dwell under the shadow of the distant Dragon Mountain. As soon as the raft of barrels came in sight, boats rowed out from the piles of the town and soon the raft was moored safely while the elves of the raft and the boatmen went to feast in Lake Town. As the shades of night fell, Bilbo began to cut loose the barrels and bring them to shore to free the dwarves. I'll have you out in a minute. Be quiet now. Ah! So sore and stiff and bruised. Oh. oh, it's you, Thorin. Yes, it is. I think. Ah, oh, this miserable wet straw. Well, are you alive or are you dead? I'm not certain yet. Are you still in prison or are you free? And if you want to go on with this silly adventure, it's yours after all and not mine. You'd better slap your arms and rub your legs and try and help me get the others out while there's a chance. You're right, Mr. Baggins. Let's pull the others ashore and open the barrels. to thank our stars and Mr. Baggins. I'm sure he has a right to expect it. Oh, I wish he could have arranged a more comfortable journey. Oh, I... No doubt we shall feel properly grateful when we're fed and recovered. And in the meanwhile, what's next? I suggest Lake Town. Well, what else is there? Nothing else could, of course, be suggested. 
So leaving the others, Thorin and Feely and Keeley and the Hobbit went along the shore to the great bridge that connected the floating town with the shore. The guards were drinking and laughing by a fire in their hut and did not hear the noise of the unpacking of the dwarves or the footsteps of the four scouts. Their astonishment was enormous when Thorin Oakenshield stepped in through the door. Who are you? And, and what do you want? Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thor, king under the mountain. I have come back. I wish to see the master of your town. Oh, and, and who are these? Who are these? Feely and Keely of the race of Durin, Mr. Baggins, who has traveled with us out of the west. If you come in peace, lay down your arms. We have none. We have no need of weapons who return at last to our own as spoken of old. Take us to your master. Yeah, he is at feast. Then all the more reason for taking us to him. We're worn and famished after a long road, and we have sick comrades. All right, follow me then. <laughs> the guard and his men led them over the bridge, through the gates, and into the town. They were taken to a great hall with many lights and the sound of many voices. The master of the town sprang from his chair as they entered. But none rose in greater surprise than the raft men of the elves who were sitting at the lower end of the hall. I am Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thor, king under the mountain. I return. These are prisoners of our king that have escaped, wandering vagabond dwarves that could not give any good account of themselves, sneaking through the woods and molesting our people. Is this true? It is true that we were wrongfully waylaid by the elven king and imprisoned without cause as we journeyed back to our own land. But lock nor bar may hinder the homecoming spoken of old. Nor is this town in the wood elves' realm. I speak to the master of the town of the men of the lake, not to the raft men of the elven king. Although the elven king was very powerful in those parts, and the master wished for no enmity with him, the people quickly settled the matter for him. Indeed, such excitement had not been known in the town in the memory of the oldest grandfather. The wood elves themselves began to wonder greatly, and even to be afraid. They did not know, of course, how Thorin had escaped, and they began to think their king might have made a serious mistake. Soon the other dwarves were brought into the town amid scenes of astonishing enthusiasm. They were all doctored and fed and housed and pampered in the most delightful and satisfactory fashion. Indeed, within a week they were quite recovered, fitted out in fine cloth, with beards combed and trimmed and proud steps. Thorin looked and walked as if his kingdom was already regained and smog chopped up into little pieces. At the end of a fortnight, Thorin began to think of departure. So he spoke to the master and his counselors and said that soon he and his company must go on towards the mountain. The master had never thought that the dwarves would actually dare to approach Smog, but believed they were frauds who would sooner or later be discovered and be turned out. But he was not sorry at all to let them go. They were expensive to keep, so he gave them what help he could to speed them on their way. So one day, although autumn was now getting far on and winds were cold and leaves were falling fast, three large boats left Lake Town, laden with rowers, dwarves, Mr. Baggins, and many provisions. Horses and ponies had been sent round by circuitous paths to meet them at their appointed landing place. The master and his counselors bade them farewell from the great steps of the town hall that went down to the lake. People sang on the quays and out of windows. The white oars dipped and splashed, and off they went north up the lake on the last stage of their long journey. The only person thoroughly unhappy was Bilbo.
In two days going, they rode right up the long lake and passed out into the river running. And now they could all see the lonely mountain, towering grim and tall before them. At the end of the third day, some miles up the river, they drew into the western bank and disembarked. Here they were joined by the horses with other provisions and necessaries and the ponies for their own use that had been sent to meet them. We'll camp here for the night and begin our journey in the morning. Will you stay with us tonight before returning to Lake Town? Not so near the shadow of the mountain. Not at any rate until the songs have come true. But the night is already drawing on. We must return. Farewell. Farewell. What a bleak and barren place. Once it was green and fair. It is the desolation of the dragon, and we have come at the waning of the year. It was a weary journey. There was no laughter or song or sound of harps, and the pride and hopes which had stirred in their hearts at the singing of old songs by the lake died away to a plodding gloom. They were at the end of their journey, but as far as ever it seemed from the end of their quest. None of them had much spirit left. Now, strange to say, Mr. Baggins had more than the others. He would often borrow Thorin's map and gaze at it, pondering over the runes and the message of the moon letters Elrond had read. It was he that made the dwarves begin the dangerous search on the western slopes for the secret door. Day after day they toiled in parties searching for paths up the mountainside. Day after day they came back to their camp without success. But at last, unexpectedly, they found what they were seeking. Feely and Keely and the hobbit came on what looked like rough steps going upwards. It was the entrance to the secret door. Yes. Yeah. This is the place where the secret door opened. I don't see any sign of a door. There's no keyhole. The door is sealed by magic and will not open until the proper spell is found. And what are you doing, Mr. Baggins? You said sitting on the doorstep and thinking would be my job, not to mention getting inside. So I'm sitting and thinking. Watching these huge snails here seems to be your job. Tomorrow begins the last week of autumn. Yeah, and winter comes after autumn. Uh, next year after that, and our beards will grow till they hang down the cliff to the valley. Unless something happens here, what is our burglar doing for us? I'm beginning to think he might go through the front gate and spy things out a bit. It's always me that has to get you out of your difficulties. What can I do? Leave me alone so I can think. For days, Bilbo sat gazing at the stone wall, thinking. He had a queer feeling that he was waiting for something. All the dwarves were off in various places on the mountainside. Perhaps the wizard will suddenly come back today. What's that? It's an enormous thrush, nearly coal black, knocking a snail against the stone. Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks. Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks. That's it! That's it! Thorin! Dwarves! What in the deuce, Mr. Baggins? You'll have smog here with all that yelling. What is it? Hey, what happened? That thrush is knocking against the stone wall with one of the huge snails. Well, what of it? Really, Mr. Baggins? Don't you remember the moon letters on the map? Mm -hmm. Elrond read them. Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks, and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. And this is Durin's day, the first day of the last moon of autumn. But the sun's almost down now. Watch. Look. The sun's cast a gleam of light on the smooth rock face. A piece of rock has broken from the wall. There's a hole in it. The key, the key. Try it now while there's still time. A door five feet high and three broad was outlined, and slowly, without a sound, swung inwards. 
it seemed as if darkness flowed out like a vapor from the hole in the mountainside, and deep darkness in which nothing could be seen lay before their eyes, a yawning mouth leading in and down. Now is the time for our esteemed Mr. Baggins, who has proved himself a good companion on our long road, and a hobbit full of courage and resource far exceeding his size, and, if I may say so, possessed of good luck far exceeding the usual allowance. Now is the time for him to perform the service for which he was included in our company. Now is the time for him to earn uh, his reward. If you mean you think it is my my job to go into the secret passage first, O Thorin Thrain, son, Oaken Shield. May your beard grow ever longer. Say so at once and have done. I might refuse. I've got you out of two messes already, which were hardly in the original bargain, so that I'm already owed some reward. Perhaps I have begun to trust my luck more than I used to in the old days. But anyway, I think I'll go and have a peep at once and get it over. Now, who will come with me? He did not expect a chorus of volunteers, so he was not disappointed. Balin, who was rather fond of the hobbit, said he would go inside at least, and perhaps a bit of the way, too, ready to call for help if necessary. Not far inside the passage, he bade Bilbo, Good luck! and stopped. Then the hobbit slipped on his ring and crept noiselessly down, down, down into the dark. Now you're in for it at last, Bilbo Baggins. You went and put your foot right in it that night of the party, and now you've got to pull it out and pay for it. A fool I am. Whew, it's getting warm. Is that a kind of glow I seem to see coming right ahead down there? It was. It was a red light steadily getting redder and redder. Wisps of vapor floated up and passed him, and he began to sweat. A sound, too, began to throb in his ears, mixed with a rumble as of a gigantic tomcat purring. Bilbo stopped. Going on from there was the bravest thing he ever did. He fought the real battle in the tunnel alone before he ever saw the vast danger that lay in wait. But go on he did until he came to the bottommost cellar of the ancient dwarves right at the mountain's root. He peeped inside the huge cavern and there Rising from the near side of the rocky floor is the great glow, the glow of smog. There he lay, a vast red golden dragon, fast asleep. A thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils, and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, and about him on all sides stretching away across the unseen floors lay countless piles of precious things, gold wrought and unwrought, gems and jewels, and silver red stained in the ruddy light. Smog lay, with wings folded like an immeasurable bat turned partly on one side so that the hobbit could see his underparts and his long, pale belly crusted with gems and fragments of gold from his long lying on his costly bed. The hobbit gazed for what seemed an age. Then he stole from the shadow of the doorway across the floor to the nearest edge of the mounds of treasure. Above him the sleeping dragon lay, a dire menace even in his sleep. Bilbo grasped a great two-handled cup, as heavy as he could carry, and cast one fearful eye upwards. Smog stirred a wing, opened a claw, 
and the rumble of his snoring changed its note. Then Bilbo fled. His heart was beating, and a more fevered shaking was in his legs than when he was going down, but still he clutched the cup. I've done it! I've done it! This will show them! More like a grocer than a burglar indeed. Well, we'll hear no more of that. And we have Mr. Baggins to thank for the recovery of our treasure. We are at your service, Mr. Baggins. What is that? Quick! The door! The tunnel! My cousins, Bomber and Bulfer, we've forgotten them. They're down below looking after the ponies. Oh, they'll be slain and all our ponies too. We can do nothing. <laughs> Nonsense, we can't leave them. Get inside, Mr. Baggins and Marlin and you two feeling, Keely. The dragon shan't have all of us. Now, you others, where are the ropes? Be quick. Near the perilous cliff's edge, the dwarves hauled madly on the ropes. Up came Bofer. Up came Bomber, puffing and blowing while the ropes creaked. Up came some tools and bundles of supplies. Then a whirring noise was heard. A red light touched the points of the standing rocks. The dragon came. Smog came hurtling from the north, licking the mountainsides with flame, beating his great wings with a noise like a roaring wind. His hot breath shriveled the grass before the door and drove in through the crack they had left and scorched them as they lay hid. Every now and again through the night they could hear the roar of the flying dragon grow and then pass and fade as he hunted round and round the mountainsides. Finally, Slow and silent, he crept back to his lair and half closed his eyes. The next morning they debated long on what was to be done. But they could think of no way of getting rid of smog, which had always been a weak point in their plans, as Bilbo felt inclined to point out. But they began to grumble at the hobbit, blaming him for what had at first so pleased them, for bringing away a cup and stirring up Smog's wrath so soon. What else do you suppose a burglar is to do? I wasn't engaged to kill dragons, that's warrior's work, but to steal treasure. Did you expect me to trot back with the whole horde of Thror on my back? I'd need hundreds of years to bring it all up. If I was fifty times as big and smog as tame as a rabbit. Yeah, Mr. Baggins is right, of course. Excuse us if we're a trifle upset. What do you propose we should do? I have no idea at the moment if you mean about removing the treasure. That obviously depends entirely on some new turn of luck and the getting rid of smog. Getting rid of dragons is not at all in my line, but I'll do my best to think about it. But what can we do now, today? We can do nothing but stay where we are. I'll make you an offer. Mm. I've got my ring and we'll creep down this very noon, then if ever Smog ought to be napping, and see what he's up to. Mm. Perhaps something will turn up. Every worm has his weak spot as my father used to say. Yes, uh, that's good. Good thinking. Well, naturally, the dwarves accepted the offer eagerly. Already they had come to respect little Bilbo. Now he had become the real leader in their adventure. He had begun to have ideas and plans of his own. When midday came, he started on his journey down into the mountain. So silent was his going that smoke on a gentle wind could hardly have surpassed it, and he was inclined to feel a bit proud of himself as he drew near the lower door. Old Smog is weary and asleep. He can't see me, and he won't hear me. Cheer up, Bilbo. The hobbit was just about to step out onto the floor when he caught a sudden thin and piercing ray of red from under the drooping lid of Smog's left eye. He was only pretending to sleep. 
Say, I did not believe them. Do you now? Truly, songs and tales fall utterly short of the reality. Oh, smart, the cheapest and greatest of calamities. You have nice manners for a thief and a liar. You seem familiar with my name. I don't seem to remember smelling you before. Who are you and where do you come from, may I ask? May indeed I come from under the hill and under the hills and over the hills my paths led. And through the air I am he that walks unseen. So I can well believe. But that is hardly your usual name. I am the clue finder, the web cutter, the stinging fly. I was chosen for the lucky number. <laughs> Lovely titles, but lucky numbers don't always come off. I am he that buries his friends alive and drowns them and draws them alive again from the water. I came from the end of a bag, but no bag went over me. Oh, these don't sound so creditable. I am the friend of bears and the guest of eagles. I am the ring winner and luck wearer, and I am Barrel Rider. Uh, that's better. Yeah, but don't let your imagination run away with you. They men so nasty scheme of those miserable barrel trading lake men, or I'm a lizard. They haven't been down that way for an age and an age. And I will soon alter that. Yeah. Very well, Barrel Rider. You may walk unseen, but you did not walk all the way. Let me tell you, I ate six ponies last night, and I shall catch and eat all the others before long. In return for the excellent meal, I will give you one piece of advice for your good. Don't have more to do with dwarves than you can help. Dwarves? I know the smell and taste of dwarves. <laughs> no one better. <laughs> Don't tell me that I can eat a dwarf ridden pony and not know it. You'll come to a bad end if you go with such friends. Thief Barrel Rider? I suppose you got a fair price for that cup you took last night. Come now. Did you? Not a thing. Well, that's just like them. I suppose they're skulking outside. And your job is to do all the dangerous work and get what you can when I'm not looking for them. You don't know everything, O Smog the Mighty. Not gold alone brought us hither. <laughs> you admit the us. Why not say us? Fourteen, 
and be done with it, Mr. Lucky Number. <laughs> I'm pleased to hear that you had other business in these parts besides my goal. In that case, you may perhaps not altogether waste your time. I don't know if it occurred to you that even if you could steal the gold bit by bit, you could not get it very far. <laughs> Had you never thought of the catch? <laughs> A fourteenth share, I suppose, or something like it. Those were the terms, eh? Delivery. What about shipping and handling? What about armed guards and tolls? <laughs> oh, Barrel Rider, you've been a fool! I tell you that gold was only an afterthought with us. We came over the hill and under the hill by wave and wind for revenge! <laughs> <laughs> Revenge. Ah, the king under the mountain is dead. And where are his kin that dare seek revenge? The Lord of Dale is dead. And I have eaten his people like a wolf among sheep. I kill where I wish and none. And their like is not in the world today. Then I was but young and tender. Now I'm old and strong. Strong, strong. Thief in the shadows. My armor is like tenfold shields. My teeth are swords. My claws spears. The shock of my tail, a thunderbolt. Yeah. My wings are hurricane, and my breath, <laughs> death. I have always understood that dragons were softer underneath, especially in the region of the uh, uh, chest. Your information is antiquated. I am armored above and below with iron scales and hard. Gems. No blade can pierce me. I might have guessed it. Uh, truly, there can nowhere be found the equal of Lord Smog, the impenetrable. Here, I'll roll over so you can see my armored chest. Marvelous, perfect, flawless, staggering. Old fool, why, there's a large patch in the hollow of his left breast as bare as a snail out of its shell. Well, I really must not detain your magnificence any longer or keep you from much needed rest. Ponies take some catching, I believe, after a long start. And so do burglars. Ho, ho, ho. After this parting shot, Bilbo darted back and fled up the tunnel. It was an unfortunate remark, for the dragon spouted terrific flames after him, and he was nearly overcome. Never laugh at live dragons, Bilbo, you fool. You aren't nearly through this adventure yet. You've been listening to The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien, adapted for radio by Bob Lewis, and featuring Ray Reinhardt as Bilbo, Tom Luce as Thorin, Pat Franklin as the Elf King, and Gail Chug as the narrator. 
Also heard in the cast were Bernard Mays, Eric Bowersfeld, Joe Hughes, and Carl Haig. The Hobbit, Part 4, by J. R. R. Tolkien It was nearly evening when Bilbo stumbled and fell in a faint on the doorstep of the tunnel. The dwarves revived him and doctored his scorches as well as they could. But it was a long time before the hair on the back of his head and his heels grew properly again. As he sat on a rock outside the tunnel, he related the account of his meeting with Smog. An old thrush was sitting on a rock nearby with his head cocked on one side, listening to all that was said. Bilbo picked up a stone and threw it at the thrush, which shows what an ill temper he was in. Drat the bird. I believe he's listening, and I don't like the look of him. Don't leave him alone. The thrushes are good and friendly. This is a very old bird indeed, and is maybe the last left of the ancient breed that used to live about here, tamed to the hands of my father and my grandfather. They were a long-lived and magical race, and this might even be one of those that were alive then, a couple of hundred years or more ago. The men of Dale used to have the trick of understanding their language and use them for messengers to fly to the men of the lake and elsewhere. Well, he'll have news to take to Lake Town, all right, if that's what he's after. Oh, do get on with your tale, Mr. Baggins. I'm sure Smog knows we came from Lake Town and had help from there. I have a horrible feeling that his next move may be in that direction. I wish to goodness I'd never said that about Barrel Rider. It would make even a blind rabbit in these parts think of the lake men. Well, it can't be helped. It's difficult not to slip in talking to a dragon. Or so I've always heard. I think you did very well, if you ask me. You found out one very useful thing, at any rate. It may be a mercy and a blessing yet to know of the bare patch in the old worm's belly. Then their talk turned to the great horde itself and to the things that Thorin and Valin remembered. And Thorin told them of the fairest treasure of all, the white gem which the dwarves had found beneath the roots of the mountain, the heart of the mountain, the Arkenstone of Thrain. It was like a globe with a thousand facets. It shone like silver in the firelight, like water in the sun, like snow under the stars, like rain upon the moon. All the while they talked, the thrush listened, till at last when the stars began to peep forth, it silently spread its wings and flew away. I'm sure we're very unsafe here, and I don't see the point of sitting outside. I feel in my bones that this place will be attacked again. Smog knows now how I came down to his hall, and you can trust him to guess where the other end of the tunnel is. He'll break all this side of the mountain to bits, if necessary, to stop up our entrance, and if we're smashed with it, the better he'll like it. Well, you're very gloomy, Mr. Baggins. Why hasn't he blocked the lower end, then, if he's so eager to keep us out? I don't know. Maybe because he doesn't want to damage his bedroom. Ah. But Smog will be coming out at any minute now, and our only hope is to get well into the tunnel and shut the door. Yes, yes, all right, everyone inside. Come on, let's do as Mr. Baggins says. How will we get the door open from the inside? If we can't get it open again, the only way out is through the dragon's lair. Shut the door! I feel that dragon in my marrow shut the door before it's too late. Do as he says. <laughs> There's no trace of a keyhole on the inside. What? We're shut in the mountain. Oh, no. It's smog. Quick, further down the tunnel. Quick, move down. <laughs> They had not shut the door a moment too soon. The rocks boomed, the walls cracked, and stones fell from the roof on their heads as the mountain felt Smog's fury. He was breaking rocks to pieces, smashing wall and cliff with the lashings of his huge tail. Barrel Rider! Your feet came from 
the water side and up the water you came with the help of the lake men. Now they shall see me and remember who is the real king under the mountain. <laughs> Then Smog rose in fire and went away south towards the running river. The dwarves sat in darkness, and utter silence fell about them. Little they ate, and little they spoke. They could not count the passing of time, but after what seemed days of waiting, Thorin spoke. Let's try the door. I must feel the wind on my face soon or die. I think I'd rather be smashed by smog in the open than suffocate in here. Oh, crap. <laughs> it's the end. We'll die here. Come, while there's life, there's hope, as my father used to say. I'm going down the tunnel again. It's the only way out, and I think this time you'd better all come with me. But the dragon... We'll all be eaten. Roasted! We haven't heard him below. There may be no smog at the bottom, but then again, there may be. Uh, we'll just have to see for ourselves. Uh, we have no choice. Lead the way, Mr. Baggins. Now be as quiet as you can. If smog is there, we don't want to announce our coming in a herd. Down, down they went. The dwarves made a deal of puffing and shuffling which echoed alarmingly, but not a sound stirred below. Near the bottom, Bilbo slipped on his ring and went ahead alone. But he did not need it. The darkness was complete, and they were all invisible, ring or no ring. In fact, so black was it that the hobbit came to the opening unexpectedly, put his hand on air, stumbled forward, and rolled headlong into the hall. But nothing moved. There was not a spark of dragon fire. Confound you, smog, you worm! Stop playing hide-and-seek! Give me a light, and then eat me if you can catch me! Now I wonder what on earth smog is playing at. He's not at home today, or tonight, or whatever it is. If Owen and Glone haven't lost their tinder boxes, maybe we can make a little light and have a look round before the luck turns. Light! Can anybody make a light? Light! 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 There's nobody here! Light! What is Mr. Baggins shouting about? He'll have the dragon back if he's not there now. Glow, make a torch for Mr. Baggins. Smog isn't home, so we'll have a look about the place. Here, give me a light. You go ahead, Mr. Baggins. You're our official burglar and investigator. We'll wait here in the tunnel for your report. The dwarves sat near the door and watched as Bilbo moved across the floor, holding his tiny light aloft. Every now and again, while he was still near enough, they caught a glint and a tinkle as he stumbled on some golden thing. The light grew smaller as he wandered away into the vast hall. Then it began to rise, dancing into the air. Bilbo was climbing the great mound of treasure. Ah, what's this? The Arkenstone, the heart of the mountain, just as Thorin described it. I'll just tuck it away in my pocket. Now I'm a burglar indeed, but I suppose I must tell the dwarves about it sometime. Now I'll climb down and take a look in the great passage on the other side. I can't see his light. He's gone over the top. 
top of the treasure mound. But where is Smog? Thorin, Thorin, Owen, Glowin, Glows! The light's gone out! Bring a light! Help! Someone come and find me! Thorin! Now what on earth or under it has happened? Well, certainly not the dragon, or he wouldn't go on squeaking. He's lost his light. Come, one of you, get another light. It, it seems we've got to go and help our burglar. It's about our turn to help him, and I'm quite willing to go. Let's all go. I expect it's safe for the moment. Yes, yes. Come on. All right, sir. Mr. Baggins? Only a bat and a dropped torch. Nothing worse. Oh, <laughs> look at the treasure! Those golden hearts are still in tune! And look at these coats of mail. Look. And these golden bowls. Oh, I only wish they had something to eat in them. What jewels! Look at this! Oh! Mr. Baggins, here is the first payment of your reward. Now cast off your old coat and put on this. It's a small coat of mail. Wrought for some young elf prince long ago, I'll bet. It's made of silver steel, which the elves call mithril. And a belt of pearls and crystals. And a helmet of figured leather studded with white gems. Here, try this on, <laughs> Mr. Baggins. Mm. Uh, uh, oh, I feel magnificent, but I expect I look rather absurd. Not at all, Mr. Baggins. You look, in fact, very grand. <laughs> well, we are armed, but what good has any armor ever been before against Smog the Dreadful? We have tempted luck too long. We'd better finish our escape. You speak the truth. Let us go. I will guide you. Not in a thousand years should I forget the ways of this palace. Holding their torches above their heads, they passed through the gaping doors, not without many a backward glance of longing at the mighty treasure hoard. They passed through the great chamber of Thror, with rotting tables and chairs and benches lying overturned. Skulls and bones were upon the floor, among flagons and bowls, and broken drinking horns and dust. They passed the dark opening in a wall of rock where a spring of water gushed forth to give birth to the running river. Then a light shone ahead, and round a wide sweeping turn they stood in the broad light of day. Well, I never expected to be looking out of this door, and I never expected to be so pleased to see the sun again and to feel the wind on my face. It must be well past breakfast time. Smog's front doorstep isn't the safest place for a meal, but let's go somewhere and sit quiet for a bit. I think I know which way we should go. We ought to make for the old lookout post at the southwest corner of the mountain. How far is that? Um, five hours' march, I should think. It'll be rough going, even if the old steps are still there. More walking and more climbing without breakfast? I wonder how many breakfasts and other meals we've missed inside that nasty, clockless, timeless hole. Ah, come, come. Don't call my palace a nasty hole. You wait till it's been cleaned and redecorated. That won't be till Smog's dead. In the meantime, where is he? I hope he's not up on the mountain looking down at us. We, we must move away from here. I feel as if his eyes were on the back of my head. It's a cold, lonesome place. There may be drink, but I see no sign of food. A dragon would always be hungry in such parts. Come on, come on. Let's follow Balin's path.
Now, if you wish, like the dwarves, to hear news of Smog, you must go back to Lake Town on the evening when he smashed the secret door and flew off in a rage two days before. It's a cold night to be watching, and that's certain. And uh, not much to see. Unless there's more fire on the lonely mountain tonight. Well, something's happened up there. Last night, the watchman saw the light start and fade from midnight until dawn. Look, the lights again. See? Look uh, at them. Perhaps the king under the mountain is forging gold. It's long since he went north. It's time the songs began to prove themselves again. Which king? As like as not, it's the marauding fire of the dragon, the only king under the mountain we've ever known. Ah, uh, you're always foreboding gloomy things. Anything from floods to poison fish. Think of something cheerful. Ha, look again, look, the light is closer. The northern end of the lake is turning gold. The king beneath the mountain. The river is running gold from the mountain. The king! The, king. the river! The dragon is coming or I'm a fool. Cut the bridges. To arms. To arms. The grim-voiced fellow ran hot-foot to the master. Then warning trumpets were sounded. Every vessel in the town was filled with water. Every warrior was armed. Every arrow and dart was ready, and the bridge to the land was thrown down and destroyed. Then the roar of Smog's terrible approach grew loud, and the lake rippled red as fire beneath the awful beating of his wings. Amid shrieks and wailings and the shouts of men, he came over them, swept toward the bridges, and was foiled. The bridge was gone. And his enemies were on an island in deep water, too deep and dark and cool for his liking. The lake was mightier than he, and it would quench him before he could pass through. Roaring, he swept back over the town. A hail of dark arrows leaped up and snapped and rattled on his scales and jewels, and their shafts fell back, kindled by his breath, burning and hissing into the lake. The grim-voiced man... Bard was his name, ran to and fro, cheering on the archers and urging them to fight to the last arrow. Fire leaped from thatched roofs and wooden beam ends as smog hurtled down and passed and round again, though all had been drenched with water before he came. A sweep of his tail and the roof of the great house crumbled and smashed down. Flames unquenchable sprang high into the night. Another swoop. And another, and another house, and then another sprang afire and fell. And still no arrow hindered Smog or hurt him more than a fly from the marshes. Already men were jumping into the water on every side. Women and children were being huddled into laden boats. Weapons were flung down. Soon all the town would be deserted and burned down to the surface of the lake. But still the company of archers led by Bard held their ground. He was a descendant in long line of Jirion, Lord of Dale. He shot with a great yew bow till all his arrows but one were spent. As he bent his bow for the last time, something fluttered out of the dark to his shoulder. It was the old thrush which perched by his ear and spoke to him. Wait! The moon is rising. Look for the hollow of Smog's left breast as he flies and turns above you. The large patch is unprotected by his thick scales and hard jewels. Ah, Black Arrow, I have saved you to the last. You have never failed me, and always I have recovered you. I had you from my father and he from of old. If ever you came from the forges of the true king under the mountain, go now and speed well. The dragon swooped once more lower than ever, and his belly glittered white in the moon with sparkling fires of gems, but not in one place. The great bow twanged. The black arrow sped straight from the string, straight for the hollow by the left breast where the foreleg was flung wide. 
In it smote and vanished, barb, shaft, and feather, so fierce was its flight. With a shriek that deafened men, felled trees and split stone, smog shot spouting into the air, turned over and crashed down from on high in ruin. Full on the town he fell, splintering it to sparks and gleeds. The lake roared in. A vast steam leaped up, white in the sudden dark under the moon. There was a hiss, a gushing whirl, and then silence. And that was the end of smog. Fearfully, Thorin and company watched and waited for the dragon. From the old lookout high above the front gate, the dwarves noticed the birds were gathering. Something strange is happening. The time has gone for the autumn wanderings, and yet there are flocks of starlings and finches, and far off there are many carrion birds as if a battle were afoot. There's that old thrush again. He seems to have escaped when smog smashed the mountainside. I believe he's trying to tell us something, but I can't follow the speech of such birds. Can you make it out, Baggins? Mm, not very well. Uh, we may not understand him, but that old bird understands us, I'm sure. I only wish he was a raven. There used to be great friendship between them and the people of Thor. They often brought us secret news. I knew many among the ravens of the rocks when I was a dwarf lad. This very height was once named Raven Hill because there was a wise and famous pair, Old Cock and his wife, that lived here above the guard chamber. But I don't suppose that any of that ancient breed linger here now. Look, the old thrush has flown away. Keep watch now and see what happens. How did your people understand the raven? They spoke in ordinary language and not bird speech. And they lived many a year and their memories were long and they handed on their wisdom to their children. Look, the old thrush has returned and there's an aged raven with him, a most decrepit old bird. Thorin, son of Thrain, and Valin, son of Thundin, I'm Wark, son of Cork. Cork is dead, but he was well known to you once. It is a hundred years and three and fifty since I came out of the egg. Oh, but I do not forget what my father told me. We are few, but we remember still the king that was of old. We are at your service, Roak, son of Kark. We are pleased to see the chief of the great ravens of the mountain. The birds are gathering. What does it mean? Uh, there are tidings from the south. Some are great tidings of joy to you, and some you will not think so good. Quark, word has got out that Smog is dead. Dead? Oh, what is? Yes. Impossible. Dead? Then we have been in needless fear, and the treasure is ours. Yes, the treasure is ours. Oh, yes, yes. The thrush may his feathers never fall, saw him die, Aye. and we may trust his words. He saw him fall in battle with the men of Asgaroth in Lake Town. The third night back from now at the rising of the moon. Yes. We may go back to our halls in safety. All the treasure is ours. <laughs> Shield. Yes, the treasure is yours for the moment, but many are gathering hither beside the bird. For many are eager for a share of the spoil. Already a host of the elves is on the way. The elves? Oh, oh, by the lake, men murmur. 
that their sorrows are due to the dwarves, for they are homeless, and many have died, and smog has destroyed their town. They too think to find amends from your treasure, whether you are alive or dead. If you will listen to my counsel, oh, do not trust the master of the lake men, but rather him that shot the dragon with his bow. Bard is he of the race of Dale. He is a grim man, but true. Oh, oh, your wisdom must decide your cause. The thirteen is small remnant of the great folk of Durin that once dwelt here. Oh, we would see peace from once more among dwarves and men and elves after the long desolation. Oh, but it may cost you dear in gold. I have spoken. Rawr, rawr, rawr. Our thanks, Roak Karkson. You and your people shall not be forgotten, but none of our gold shall thieves take or the vile and carry off while we are alive. If you would earn our thanks still more, bring us news of any that draw near. Also, I would beg of you, if any of you are still young and strong of wing, fly to our kin in the mountains of the north and tell them of our plight. But go specially to my cousin Dane in the Iron Hills, for he has many people well armed and dwells nearest to this place. Bid him hasten. Oh, I will do what can be done. Now, back to the mountain. We have little time to lose. And little food to use. Back to the mountain! Back to the mountain! We shall defend the home! Back to the mountain! Now, with no fear of the dragon, the dwarves hurried back to the front gate. All the other gates had long ago been broken and blocked by smog, so now they began to labor hard in fortifying the main entrance. For days they worked until the gate was blocked with a wall of squared stones laid dry but very thick and high across the opening. They climbed in and out with ladders, and the only approach to the gate was along a narrow ledge of the cliff. There came a night when suddenly there were many lights as of fires and torches away south in Dale below them. That night the dwarves slept little. The next morning early, a company of spearmen was seen crossing the river and marching up the valley. They bore with them the green banner of the elven king and the blue banner of the lake, and they advanced until they stood right before the wall at the gate. They have come. Who are you? Let come on for war to the gates of Thorin, son of Thrain, king under the mountain. Hail, Thorin. Why do you fence yourself like a robber in his hole? We are not yet foes, and we rejoice that you are alive beyond our hope. We came expecting to find none living here. Yet now that we are met, there is matter for a parley and a council. Who are you? And of what would you parley? I am Bard, and by my hand was the dragon slain and your treasure delivered. I am by right descent the heir of Jurian of Dale, and in your hoard is mingled much of the wealth of his halls and town, which old Smog stole. Are these not matters of which we may speak? I would speak for the people of Lake Town, whose dwellings were destroyed by Smog in his last battle. Have you no thought for their sorrow and misery, who aided you in your distress? Have they no claim upon the treasure? You put your worst cause last and in the chief place. To the treasure of my people no man has a claim, because Smog, who stole it from us, also robbed him of life or home. The treasure was not Smog's that his evil deed should be amended with a share of it. The price of the goods and the assistance that we received of the lake men we will fairly pay in due time. But nothing 
will we give not even a loaf's worth under threat of force. While an armed host lies before our doors, we look on you as foes and thieves. I ask you, what share of the wealth would you have paid to our kindred had you found the horde unguarded and us slain? A uh, just question. But you are not dead and we are not robbers. Still, my other claims remain unanswered. I will not parley, as I have said, with armed men in my gate, nor at all with the people of the Elven King, whom I remember with small kindness. Be gone now, ere our elves fly. We will give you time to repent your words. Gather your wisdom ere we return. <laughs> Ere many hours were passed, the banner bearers returned and trumpeters stood forth and blew a blast. In the name of Esgaroth and the forest, we speak under Thorin, Thrain, son, Oakenshield, calling himself the king under the mountain, and we bid him consider well the claims that have been urged or be declared our foe. At the least, he shall deliver one twelfth portion of the treasure unto Bard as the dragon slayer and as the heir of Jirion. From that portion, Bard will himself contribute to the aid of Eskaroth or Lake Town. The treasure is mine. Then Thorin seized a bow of horn and shot an arrow at the messenger. It smote into his shield and stuck there, quivering. Since such is your answer, I declare the mountain besieged. You shall not depart from it until you call for a truce and a parley. We will bear no weapons against you, but we leave you to your gold. You may eat that, if you will. Now the days passed slowly and wearily. Many of the dwarves spent their time piling and ordering the treasure. Again and again Thorin spoke of the Arkenstone of Thrain and bade them eagerly to look for it in every corner. The Arkenstone of my father is worth more than a river of gold in itself, and to me it is beyond price. That stone of all the treasure I claim for myself, and I will be avenged on anyone who finds it and withholds it. Look, it is the old raven again. What news, Roak, son of Kark? Oh, your kinsman Dane from the Iron Hills comes from the northeast. How near is he, and how many come with him? Oh, two days march from here and brings more than five hundred dwarves i fear lest there be battle in the valley and though they are grim folk they are not likely to overcome the host that besets you walk even if they did so what will you gain winter and snow are hastening behind them oh how shall you be fed without the friendship and good will of the land about you. The treasure is likely to be your death, though the dragon is no more. Winter and snow will bite both men and elves. With my friends behind them and winter upon them, they will perhaps be in softer mood to parley with. That night, Bilbo made up his mind. 
the beginnings of a plan had come into his little head. As soon as it was full dark, he took the Arkham stone from beneath his pillow, drew a rope from his bundle, then climbed to the top of the wall where Bomber stood watch. It's mighty cold, Mr. Baggins. I wish we could have a fire up here as they have down in the camp. It's warm enough inside. I dare say, but I'm bound here till midnight. Oh, a sorry business altogether. Not that I venture to disagree with Thorin. May his beard grow ever longer. Yet he was ever a dwarf with a stiff neck. Yes, it's quite unpleasant. Listen, I'll take your turn at watch, if you like. There's no sleep in me tonight. You're a good fellow, Mr. Baggins, and I'll take your offer kindly. If there's anything to note, rouse me first, mind you. Off you go. I'll wake you at midnight, and you can wake the next watchman. Now to slip on my ring, climb down the wall, and be off. I've got about five hours. He quickly made his way toward the encampment in the valley. At last he came to the bend in the stream where he had to cross if he was to make for the camp as he wished. It was not easy for the little hobbit, but he was nearly across when he missed his footing on a round stone and fell into the cold water with a splash. What was that? That was new fish. They sit by about. Hide your lights. It'll help him more than us. If it's that odd little creature, that's the servant of the dwarfs. Servant indeed. I'll just slip the ring off and let them have a look at me in my armor. Let's have a light. I'm here if you want me. The elves fell upon him and took him to the large tent where both the elven king and bard sat before a warm fire. Soon the hobbit sat there too, drying off, still wearing his elvish armor and partly wrapped in an old blanket. Really, you know things are impossible. Personally, I'm tired of the whole affair. I wish I was back in the West, in my own home, where folk are more reasonable. But I have an interest in this matter, one fourteenth share to be precise, according to a letter which, fortunately, I believe I've kept. Ah, a share in the profits, mind you. Personally, I'm only too ready to consider all your claims carefully and deduct what's right from the total before putting in my own claim. However, you don't know Thorin Oakenshield as well as I do. I assure you, he's quite ready to sit on a heap of gold and starve as long as you sit here. Well, let him. Such a fool deserves to starve. I see your point of view. At the same time, winter is coming on fast. Before long, you'll be having snow, and supplies will be difficult, even for elves. And there'll be other difficulties. You've not heard of Dane and the dwarves of the Iron Hills? We have a long time ago. But what has he got to do with us? I thought as much. I see I have some information that you haven't. Dane is now less than two days' march off and has at least 500 grim dwarves with him. Why do you tell us this? Are you betraying your friends, or are you threatening us? My dear Bard, don't be so hasty. I never met such suspicious folk. I'm merely trying to avoid trouble for all concerned. Now, I'll make you an offer. Mm, let's hear it. You may see it. It is this. The Arkenstone of Thrain. Oh. The heart of the mountain. I've heard of it before. It's also the heart of Thorin. He values it above a river of gold. I give it to you to aid in your bargaining. Mm. But how is it yours to give? Well, it isn't exactly, but I'm willing to let it stand against all my claim. I may be a burglar, but I'm an honest one, more or less. Anyway, I'm going back now. I hope you'll find it useful. Mirabeau Baggins, you are more worthy to wear the armor of elf princes than many that have looked more comely in it. But I wonder if Thorin Oakenshield will see it so. I advise you to remain with us. Thank you very much, but I don't think I ought to leave my friends like this, after all we've gone through together. And I promise to wake old Bomber at midnight. Really, I must be going, and quickly. Nothing they could say would stop him, so an escort was provided for him. As they passed through the camp, an old man, wrapped in a dark cloak, rose from a tent door where he was sitting and came towards them. <laughs> well done, Mr. Baggins. 
There's always more about you than anyone expects. Gandalf, where did you come from? How did you get... <laughs> All in good time. Things are drawing towards the end now, unless I'm mistaken. There's an unpleasant time just in front of you. But keep your heart up. You may come through all right. There's news brewing that even the ravens haven't heard. Good night. Good night. Good night, Gandalf. Puzzled but cheered, Bilbo hurried on. He was guided to a safe ford and set across dry, and before midnight he was back at the gate. He woke up Bomber, and then rolled himself up in his corner and was soon fast asleep, forgetting all his worries till the morning. As a matter of fact, he was dreaming of eggs and bacon. A company of twenty or so is approaching. I see Bard and the Elven King among them. And an old man wrapped in cloak and hood who is bearing a strong casket of iron-bound wood. Ah, uh, I suppose they've heard of the coming of Dane. I thought that would alter their mood. Hail, Thorin. Are you still of the same mind? My mind does not change with the rising and setting of a few suns. The elf host has not departed. Till then you come in vain to bargain with me. Is there then nothing for which you would yield any of your gold? Nothing that you or your friends have to offer. What of this? The Arken Stone of Thrain. Oh. What's that? That stone was my father's and is mine. How came you to have the heirloom of my house? We are not thieves. Your own we will give back in return for our own. How came you by it? I gave it to them. No. You, you miserable hobbit, you undersized burglar. By the beard of Duran, I wish I had Gandalf here. Curse him for his choice of you. May his beard wither. As for you, I'll throw you to the rock. Hey, your wish is granted. Here is Gandalf, and none too soon, it seems. If you don't like my burglar, please don't damage him. Put him down and listen first to what he has to say. You all seem in league. Never again will I have dealings with any wizard or his friends. Now, what have you to say, you descendant of rats? Dear me, this is all very uncomfortable. You may remember saying that I might choose my own fourteenth share. Take it that I have disposed of my share as I wished and let it go at that. I will. And I'll let you go at that, and may we never meet again. For oh, the Arkenstone, I will give one fourteenth share of the hoard in silver and gold, setting aside the gems. That shall be accounted the promised share of this, this traitor! Now get down to your friends, or I'll throw you down. Time was when you seemed to think that I had been of some service. Descendant of rats, indeed. You are not making a very splendid figure as king under the mountain, Thorin. But things may change yet. They may indeed. Farewell, dwarves. We may meet again as friends. Be off! You have a coat of mail upon you. It was made by my folk, and it is too good for you. It cannot be pierced by arrows, but if you don't hasten, I'll sting your miserable feet. So be swift. So Bilbo joined Gandalf and Bard, and together they returned to the camp in the valley. That day passed, and the night. The next day the wind shifted west and the air was dark and gloomy. Runners came to report that Dane and his army of dwarves had come. 
Each one was clad in a hauberk of steel mail that hung to his knees, and his legs were covered with hose of a fine and flexible metal mesh, the secret of whose making was possessed by Dane's people. The dwarves were exceedingly strong for their height, and in battle they wielded heavy two-handed mattocks. Each of them had also a short broadsword at his side and a round shield slung at his back. Their beards were forked and plated and thrust into their belts. Their caps were of iron and they were shod with iron and their faces were grim. Trumpets called men and elves to arms. Before long the dwarves could be seen coming into the valley at a great pace. Soon they had advanced along the eastern bank. Suddenly, without a signal, they sprang silently forward to attack. Bows twanged and arrows whistled from the archers hidden above in the rocks of the mountain. Still more suddenly, a darkness came on with dreadful swiftness. A black cloud hurried over the sky. Winter thunder on a wild wind rolled roaring up and rumbled in the mountain, and lightning lit its peak. And beneath the thunder another blackness could be seen whirling forward. But it did not come with the wind. It came from the north, like a vast cloud of birds, so dense that no light could be seen between their wings. Gandalf, standing alone, with arms uplifted between the advancing dwarves and the ranks awaiting them, cried out in a voice like thunder, and his staff blazed forth with a flash like the lightning. Dread has come upon you all! The goblins are upon you! Balg of the North is coming, O Dane, whose father you slew in Moria! Behold, the bats are above his army like a sea of locusts! They ride upon wolves, and wolves are in their train! Come, there is yet time for counsel. Let Dane come swiftly to us. So began a battle that none had expected, and it was called the Battle of the Five Armies, and it was very terrible. Upon one side were the goblins and the wild wolves, and upon the other were elves, and men, and dwarves. The goblins were the foes of all. So the army of Dane, the warriors of the elven king, and the men who followed Bard took their places at the mountain, hoping to lure the goblins into the valley between the arms of the mountain. On the southern spur, in its lower slopes and in the rocks at its feet, the elves were set. On the eastern spur were men and dwarves. As Gandalf had hoped, the goblin army poured in rage into the valley. Their banners were countless, black and red, and they came on like a tide in fury and disorder. The elves were the first to charge. Their hatred for the goblins is cold and bitter. Their spears and swords shone in the gloom with a gleam of chill flame, so deadly was the wrath of the hands that held them. As soon as the goblin host was dense in the valley, the elves sent against it a shower of arrows, and each flickered as it fled as if with stinging fire. Behind the arrows a thousand of their spearmen leapt down and charged. The yells were deafening. The rocks were stained black with goblin blood. Just as the goblins were recovering from the onslaught of the elf charge, there rose from across the valley a deep-throated roar. With cries of Moria and Dane, Dane, the dwarves of the Iron Hills plunged in, wielding their mattocks, and beside them came the men of the lake with long swords. Panic came upon the goblins, and many were flying back down the river to escape from the trap. Many of their own wolves were turning upon them and rending the dead and wounded. But only the first onslaught of the black tide had been stemmed. As the day drew on, 
A host of wargs came ravening, and with them came the bodyguard of Bolg, goblins of huge size with scimitars of steel. As darkness fell from a stormy sky, great bats swirled about the heads and ears of elves and men, or fastened vampire-like on the stricken. Now Bard was fighting to defend the eastern spur, and yet giving slowly back. And the elf lords were at bay about their king upon the southern arm of the mountain. They had forgotten Thorin. Out leapt the king under the mountain, and his companions followed him. Hood and cloak were gone. They were in shining armor, and red light leapt from their eyes. In the gloom, the great dwarf gleamed like gold in a dying fire. Wolf and rider fell or fled before them. Thorin wielded his axe with mighty strokes, and nothing seemed to harm him. To me, to me, elves and men, to me, oh, my kinfolk! Down rushed all the dwarves of Dane. Down too came many of the lake men. And out upon the other side came many of the spearmen of the elves. Once again the goblins were stricken in the valley and they were piled in heaps till Dale was dark and hideous with their corpses. But among the goblin dead lay many men and many dwarves and many a fair elf that should have lived yet long ages merrily in the wood. But Thorin and his followers were too few. Soon the attackers were attacked. The bodyguard of Bolg came howling against them and drove in upon their ranks like waves upon cliffs of sand. On all this Bilbo looked with misery. He had put on his ring early in the business and vanished from sight, if not from all danger. A magic ring of that sort is not a complete protection in a goblin charge, nor does it stop flying arrows and wild spears. But it does help in getting out of the way, and it prevents your head from being specially chosen for a sweeping stroke by a goblin swordsman. It will not be long now before the goblins win the gate and we're all slaughtered or driven down and captured. Really, it's enough to make one weep. I'd rather old Smog had been left with all the wretched treasure than that these vile creatures should get it. And poor old Bumber and Balin and Feely and Keely and all the rest come to a bad end. And Bard, too. And the lake men and the merry elves. The clouds were torn by the wind and a red sunset slashed the west. Seeing the sudden gleam in the gloom, Bilbo looked and saw dark shapes, small yet majestic, against the distant glow. The eagles! The eagles! The eagles are coming! Soon the elves and dwarves took up the cry, and it echoed across the valley. But at that moment a stone hurtling from above smote heavily on Bilbo's helm, and he fell with a crash and knew no more. When Bilbo came to himself, he was literally by himself. No one was near. He was shaking and as chilled as stone, but his head burned with fire. Oh, oh my head. Now I wonder what's happened. At any rate, I'm not yet one of the fallen heroes, but I suppose there's still time enough for that. Baggins! Bilbo Baggins! Hello there! Hello there! What news? What voice is it that speaks among the stones? Well, I'm blessed. This invisibility has its drawbacks after all. I'd better remove the ring. It's me, Bilbo Baggins! It's well I've found you. You're needed, and we've looked for you long. Gandalf has had us searching all morning. Are you much hurt? A nasty knock on the head, I think. But I have a helm and a hard skull. All the same, I feel sick, and my legs are like straws. I'll carry you down to the camp in the valley. Baggins, a 
alive after all. I am glad. I began to wonder if even your luck would see you through. Your arm's in a sling. Poor terrible business, and it, it nearly was disastrous. There are few unharmed in all our host. But come inside the tent you're called for. Hail, Thorin. I have brought him. Farewell, good thief. I go now to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers until the world is renewed. Since I leave now all gold and silver and go where it is of little worth, I wish to part in friendship from you, and I would take back my words and deeds at the gate. Farewell, King Under the Mountain. This is a bitter adventure if it must end so. Not a mountain of gold can amend it. Yet I'm glad that I have shared in your perils. That has been more than any Baggins deserves. No, there is more in you of good than you know, child of the kindly West. Some courage and some wisdom, blended in measure. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. But sad or merry, I must leave it now. Farewell. Farewell. Then Bilbo turned away, and he went by himself and sat alone, wrapped in a blanket. And he wept until his eyes were red and his voice was hoarse. He was a kindly little soul. Indeed, it was long before he had the heart to make a joke again. Later he learned from Gandalf how the battle had ended. And so the eagles from the Misty Mountains came to our aid. Yes, watching the gathering of the goblins, they too had gathered in great numbers. With their help, the tide of the battle turned, but even with the eagles, we were still outnumbered. In that last hour, Bjorn himself had appeared. Bjorn? Oh, no one knew how or from where. He came alone and in bear's shape, and he seemed to have grown almost to giant size in his wrath. The roar of his voice was like drums and guns, and he tossed wolves and goblins from his path like straws and feathers. It was Bjorn who stooped and lifted Thorin, who had fallen pierced with spears, and bore him out of the fray. Swiftly he returned, and his wrath was redoubled, so that nothing could withstand him, and no weapon seemed to bite upon him. He scattered the bodyguard, and pulled down Bolg himself, and crushed him. And then dismay fell on the goblins, and they fled in all directions. Some of the dwarves, and men, and elves are still pursuing them. Where are the eagles? Some are in the hunt, but most have gone back to their eyries. Dane has crowned their chief with gold and sworn friendship with them forever. I'm sorry. What? I, I mean, I, I, I should have liked to see them again. I'm almost afraid to ask, but what of my companions in Thorin's company? Of the thirteen, ten remain. Feely and Keely fell defending Thorin with shield and body, for he was their mother's elder brother. The others are with Dane. He has become king under the mountain. And the treasure? Dane has given a fourteenth share of all the silver and gold to Bard, who has divided it to his followers and friends freely and fairly. There will be a great reward for you, Mr. Baggins. My reward would be to return to my home. Will I be going soon? As soon as you like. In the next few days, Bilbo prepared to set out for his home in the Shire. But first, they buried Thorin deep beneath the mountain, and Bard laid the Arken stone upon his breast. There, let it lie till the mountain falls. May it bring good fortune to all his folk that dwell here after. Upon his tomb, the elven king then laid Orchrist, the elvish sword that had been taken from Thorin when he was captured in Mirkwood. 
It is said in songs that it gleamed ever in the dark if foes approached, and the fortress of the dwarves could not be taken by surprise. Then he took his leave of the remaining companions of Thorin and Bard, who had prepared a great treasure for Bilbo. This treasure is as much yours as it is mine, though old agreements cannot stand, since so many have a claim in its winning and defense. Even though you were willing to lay aside all your claim, I should wish to reward you most richly of all. Very kind of you, but really it's a relief to me. How on earth should I have got all that treasure home without war and murder all along the way? I'll take only these two small chests, one filled with silver and the other with gold. That's quite as much as I can manage. Farewell, Balin, and farewell, Dwalin. Farewell, dwarves. May your beards never grow thin. Goodbye, Burglar. Uh, Goodbye, And farewell, Thorin Oakenshield, and Feely, and Keely. May your memory never fade. Ah, uh, goodbye, and good luck wherever you fare. If ever you visit us again, when our halls are made fair once more, then the feast shall indeed be splendid. If, if ever you're passing my way, don't wait to knock. Tea is at four, but any of you are welcome any time. <laughs> farewell. 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 Then he turned away. In company with Gandalf, he rode behind the elven king, and beside them strode Bjorn. He had many hardships and adventures before he got back. The wild was still the wild, and there were many other things in it in those days besides goblins, but he was never in great danger again. For a while, Gandalf and Bilbo stayed at Bjorn's house, but in the early spring they took their leave of Bjorn and passed over the misty mountains. At last they came up the long road and reached the very pass where the goblins had captured them before. By now a bright sun was shining over the outstretched lands. There behind lay Mirkwood, blue in the distance, and far away was the lonely mountain on the edge of eyesight. On its highest peak, snow yet unmelted was gleaming pale. So comes snow after fire, and even dragons have their ending. I wish now only to be in my own armchair. <laughs> it was on May the 1st that the two came back at last to the Valley of Rivendell. The elves of the valley greeted them, and for many days they dwelt with Elrond, who was anxious to hear of their adventures. It was here that Bilbo learned that Gandalf had been to a great council of the white wizards during his absence from Thorin and company. The great council had driven the necromancer from his dark hold in the south of Mirkwood. At last they said farewell to Elrond, and by June they had arrived at a hill overlooking Bilbo's home. The sight of the place where he was born and bred brought forth a poem. Roads go ever, ever on, over rock and under tree, by caves where never sun has shone, by streams that never find the sea, over snow by winter sown, and through the merry flowers of June, over grass and over stone, and under mountains in the moon. Roads go ever, ever on, under cloud and under star, Yet feet that wandering have gone turn at last to home afar. Eyes that fire and sword have seen and horror in the halls of stone look at last on meadows green. And trees and hills they long have known. <laughs> My dear Bilbo, something's the matter with you. You are not the hobbit that you were. I suppose not. And it appears my home is not the same either. Look, they're having an auction. Oh, yes! It was an auction indeed. 
he had arrived back in the middle of an auction in which the effects of the late Bilbo Baggins Esquire of Bag End, Underhill, Hobbiton, were being disposed of by Bilbo's cousins, the Sackville Bagginses. They were, in fact, busy measuring his wounds to see if their own furniture would fit. It was quite a long time before Mr. Baggins was, in fact, admitted to be alive again. The people who had got specially good bargains at the sale took a deal of convincing, and in the end Bilbo had to buy back quite a lot of his own furniture. The Sackville Bagginses never admitted that the returned Baggins was genuine, and they were not on friendly terms with Bilbo ever after. As for Bilbo, he took to writing poetry and visiting the elves, and though few hobbits believed any of his tales and shook their heads and touched their foreheads and called him poor old Baggins, he remained very happy to the end of his days, and those were extraordinarily long. One autumn evening, some years afterwards, Bilbo was sitting in his study and writing his memoirs. He thought of calling them There and Back Again, A Hobbit's Holiday, when there was a ring at the door. Gandalf and Balin, come in, come in! Let me take your hoods! <laughs> Not another party, I hope. Oh, no, no, just a friendly <laughs> visit, my dear Bilbo. Well, how are things in the lands of the mountains? Very well, very well indeed. Bard has rebuilt the town of Dale, and Lake Town has been refounded, and there is friendship between elves and dwarves and men. Yes. They are making songs which say that the rivers run with gold. Then the prophecies of the old songs have turned out to be true, after a fashion. Of course, of course. And, and why shouldn't they prove true? Surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself. You don't really suppose, do you, that all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck just for your sole benefit? <laughs> You're a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I'm very fond of you, but you are are only quite a little fellow in a wide world after all. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to The Hobbit by J.R.R. R. Tolkien, the concluding program adapted for radio by Bob Lewis, and featuring Ray Reinhardt as Bilbo, Bernard Mays as Gandalf, Tom Luce as Thorin, Eric Bowersfeld as Bard, Pat Franklin as Roak and the Elf King, and Gail Chug as the narrator.